What is happening, everybody? Welcome to the Big Shred Podcast. My name is John Matos. Thank you so much for hanging out with us on a Wednesday evening. I am super excited for today's episode. We've got a couple of amazing guests, two of probably my favorite people in the metal world. So we've got Terrence Hobbs from Suffocation and Zach Householder from Whitechapel. Some some homies, just way stoked to, to have them on the podcast and cannot wait to, to get into their interviews. Now, with what we got going on in the abiotic world and in the Big Shred podcast world, so I did drop the first episode of the podcast on Spotify. So if you've got the Spotify, definitely check it out. It's not too long. It's about a 30, 35 minute episode of just me doing like a question and answer kind of thing, giving you guys some insight on why we're, we're doing the Big Shred podcast, kind of the, the guests that we're going to be having on and, and things like that. So this is the sixth live stream that I've done and I've learned a whole lot on every episode. It's been It's been pretty sick so far and just getting to talk to hopefully some of your favorite, definitely some of my favorite people in the industry. So definitely follow us on the Twitters and the Instagrams and the Twitch and the YouTube and all that good shit. Follow us on Spotify as well. Check this out. I'm going to be dropping the episode with Chaney and Sanjay that we did a week ago, two weeks ago. I don't know what fucking day it is anymore. We, we did it not too long ago. I'm going to be dropping that episode on the Spotify here pretty soon. We've got some great streams coming up as well. Got a lot of great guests already scheduled and and got some great things in the works. So for for next week, again, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, and hopefully we'll be doing a couple of guests per stream. So really excited to be doing this and to get to talk to some of my homies and so that you guys can get a little bit of insight into their world. So without further ado... I actually will bring on our first guest of the night and easily one of my favorite people in metal in general, one of my favorite guys I've ever toured with, and I know you guys are going to have a whole lot of fun getting to know my homie, Terrence Hobbs. Terrence, how the fuck are you, my dude? Uh, Johnny boy, I'm chilling. How you doing, man? (laughs) Good, good. You're you're a little off camera there, Terrence. <laughs> yeah, you know what it is. There's so much sunlight. Look at this. Despise <laughs> the sun every day, so I'm just trying to stay out of it for the meantime. Can you, you know? can you twist your camera in your direction a little bit by any chance? Yeah, I can I can manipulate a little something. something. Is this better? That's better. There you go. I got to see that yeah. that handsome face, dude. <laughs> Thanks, <John. laughs> What's yeah. good, man? How how how's how have things been going? How's Corona and all this quarantine shit treating you? Uh, What's well? I mean, you know, for us, we were over there in Europe with Belfagor and a couple of other bands. Um, we were slated to come home on the like twenty eighth of March, and uh, yeah. when it got to about the fourteenth, that's when Trump did that uh whole travel ban thing. Yeah, said you got forty eight hours to get out. Now you know. Never in my lifetime, and I, I mean, I've been doing this for like thirty something years at this point. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. I've never had to like really even consider with my band to have to like leave someplace. You know what I mean? Like just the show normally goes on. You, if you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, it's fucking wild, dude. Yeah, it was like really like just a horrible type of situation. So you know, I had my whole entire band with me, obviously there, and we were playing in Switzerland, which was a makeup show for another show in Italy and um, it or or another show in Switzerland, I guess one, one show in Switzerland got canceled. Both the shows in Italy got canceled. So everything just kind of, you know, went South from that point. So, you know, democratically, I just asked everybody in the band what they wanted to do. I was like, do you guys think we can stick it out until the 28th? Cause nobody knew the severity of the, of the problem. I mean, obviously it was in a, it was in Italy and it was in other places like Spain. That's a, that's my dog Hunter, by the way. <laughs> oh, I never but, met your dog, dude. Yeah, he's a good boy. Aww. He's a good boy. <laughs> he was sad. Anyhow, so uh, yeah, you know, it came down to a democratic vote with my band in Switzerland, and and I mean, we we're maybe like an hour or two outside of Geneva, and everybody was like, "Go home." 
Uh, I got in touch with EMG. I got to say thank you guys for, uh, you know, really being on the ball with it because without them, it would have been like such a hassle to try to like rebook tickets. Um, you know, obviously EMG has a bunch of bands, our management company. Yeah. They have a bunch of bands out there. And I mean, you know, they were really on the ball. They were very attentive. And I mean, we got home. We had no problems. Nobody showed any signs of sickness. I still haven't. Good. I mean, you know, I've done the home quarantine. I'm a smoker to, to boot. So, <laughs> and plus I turned 50. So what the fuck? You yeah, know, dude. I, happy fucking birthday, man. I'm so bummed that yeah. like we weren't hanging for that. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, it's it's great being able to like reminisce in our touring days. I mean, we just did a couple of shows together not that long ago. Yeah, but, yeah. Like unbelievable. So, you know, the band, the band in itself. You know, it contemplated it. And I mean, from this point, from that point on, that was like the last time I seen my drummer. My drummer's Canadian. They closed the Canadian board of the States. Now I can't even get the guy here for rehearsal. You know, so, I mean, it's a real thing. I have a lot of friends that are, you know, nurses and doctors out here on Long Island. And they're just like, they're telling me just how brutal it is in these, uh, in their hospital rooms and how overpacked the morgues are and, just shit like that. And it's like kind of unbelievable because at first I'm like, dude, come on, I'll just grin and bear it. I'm on top of a mountain in Switzerland. Yeah, right. Fucking next thing you know, I'm calling <laughs> and my friends are telling me, oh shit, look at how many people are fucking dying. Wear your face mask. So I literally quarantined myself for like at least, I mean, really, I haven't gone out. I have a face mask and everything else, but yeah. uh, I only go out to go to go shopping and maybe see my family. And I mean, you know, they're police officers and, and nurses. So I don't really have to worry too much about that. But I mean, best thing for everybody is just stay home as long as you can. I mean, I know it sucks not being able to play and work, but damn, you know, things are real. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I was able to get home unscathed, not sick. haven't felt any signs of sickness unless it's self-inflicted from alcohol. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm good to go, you know? Yeah. But then you got a little bit of weed. So you're, you're in good shape though. Um, yeah. I mean, Come there on. you go. Enjoy, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, dude, I, I'm so glad when, you know, for my homies. <laughs> when I, when I heard about all this shit that was going down, I knew you guys were out there. I had a couple other friends that were out there too. And I was just like, fuck, like, how is this going to pan out? Are, yeah, are they going to yeah. get stuck out there? And so, like you said, shout out to EMG and all the managers and booking agents yeah, that helped you know, help you know, their bands get out of that shit, you know, let alone that it's going to impact all of us touring bands. I mean, you know, that's my whole life is going out and playing shows and touring and, you know, being able to see my friends and just enjoying what the scene has to offer after all these years, you know, even if it's small clubs. And I mean, from the smallest promoters to the biggest promoters, from the biggest bands to the smallest bands, this has really fucking hit the industry hard, let alone the industry was fucked up to begin with, but it, it really actually has put a big damper on things for everybody. And yeah. so, you know, everybody stay safe and stay sane. I want to see you back out on the road when we hit it too, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and I got to say, dude, from all the bands that I've toured with and toured with a, a, my fair share, you, I'd say in particular, are, you probably been doing it the longest and you're like the least jaded that I've seen, man. So it's, it, it's something to aspire to for dudes that do this, that you obviously know what the game is about and you know that it's not easy and you know that it's not for everybody. But Definitely. I feel like... It definitely takes up a lot of time and effort, especially from the business standpoint, let alone to the playing standpoint, you know? So it's, it's definitely tough, man. But you've yeah. got this appreciation for it and you're there with a fucking big ass smile on your face no matter what the show is go is looking like or what's going on that day. And it's it's awesome to see. And like I said, it's something to aspire to, man. It, it puts stuff into perspective of like, I've been doing this for six seven years you've been doing it for 30 and if you can Very well. yeah and if you can if you can still do every show and and all the shit that's that comes along with the difficulties of doing all this shit it 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 gives bands like us like wow we can still do this shit we just got to stick it out you know yeah you really you know that's the main key i mean iron maiden said it best you got to stick to your guns you know yeah and stay original to what you're doing which is why you know of course suffocation has tried different different things throughout the course of the years. I mean, we got a shit ton of records. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we still try to keep to the roots of everything and be brutal and still, you know, keep the heaviness, even though now everybody's got seven, eight, nine, ten string guitars. <laughs> a whole different ball game from back in the day. But, 
still, I mean, we enjoy it. We want to, you know, keep that vibe alive for everybody that's been through it with us, you know? And you've been doing that, man. And, and, you know, however many strings that may be the case, you know, we play seven strings, whatever. Only, only six, buddy, six. <laughs> but you, you guys, and I can say it, I've seen you guys probably 50 times now or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've done quite <laughs> We've actually played all together with cattle decapitation. Yeah, you know? yeah. That was and so much fun, dude. That was so sick. That that is still one of my best memories touring, man. Doing doing that run in Europe great? with you guys. And watching the bus and watching the bus spin around on that thing in the Netherlands. Dude, I I big. talk about that. I still talk about that to this day when I explain yeah, to people yeah. how different it is in Europe that the countries actually invest in the arts. Yeah, I mean, they, they really, they do a lot. I mean, even that place in particular, I can't remember the name of it, but Nijivision or something? Or <laughs> yeah. One of them. I, I mean, I've played so many shows, I can't remember the name. Nijmegen, I think you're close. I, I don't know how to fucking pronounce yeah. it, but. Yeah, exactly. I can't pronounce it. I'm probably bad at Dutch. Maybe that's, you know, why everything just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was so crazy just being able to, um, you know, to go and experience those things. Like how tight the streets were and that they invested in that venue to pick up a bus and a trailer and hydraulically spin the fucking thing around is yeah. out of control. That's out of control. Yeah, for the people who don't know what we're we're fucking talking about. Yeah, there there's a venue in Switzerland or Sweden, wherever the fuck we were. In, in that, the Netherlands. It's in, in the Netherlands. In, in the Netherlands. And yeah. there's a garage where you park the, the van and trailer or the van, listen to me, the bus and trailer. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Huge, huge, obviously, bus and trailer. It, it pulls into this platform and so that you don't have to do the fucking Austin Powers, like, 50-point turn to get out yeah. of that bitch. It lifts you up and just spins your ass around. And I, I took video of it. I was like, what the fuck? This is way too sick. Dude, that was the same venue that we, for catering, they had their own kitchen specifically yeah, to cook yeah. for the bands and we had that chef come out and present the meal and talk about like the bread that they baked the day before and fucking yeah the i mean that place, the place treats the bands great i mean a lot of a lot of bands have played there like a really huge bands and it's unfortunate that the only times i get to actually be there and enjoy the show is when we're playing it not there to go and see like body count play there you know yeah like, i know shit I know. like that it's <laughs> like off the hook shit Gotta yeah. get a little vacation out there once all this this shit settles down, man. You, and you, well, you I mean, this is, this is my vacation now, but it's not necessarily vacation. It's like a stress vacation. Yeah, know? yeah, seriously. It's, yeah, time wow. to just put down and write music and just focus while, you know, while everything's on lockdown. It's fucked up. Yeah, dude. So so you guys pushing pushing some merch from, from the tour? Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, we had just, uh, I mean, the tour was actually going really well for us over there with Belfagor, and, uh, you know, we had done some shows with Hate and Ultimus in Russia right before that. Yep. So um, once we got to Europe, you know, we were selling merch, like, it was just going, it was going at a pretty good rate anyway. Yep. So we reordered some tour shirts and everything from Indie Merch, and uh, it turned out, I mean, like, literally the next day we were supposed to get it. And we had to fly home. So Indie Merch is doing something really cool, which is they're putting it out online, those tour shirts, with a pretty cool fucking stamp on it that says, fuck COVID-19, you know what I mean? That's so sick. Over the tour day, and you can only get it from them at this point, if you guys want it. So I really appreciate Indie Merch, uh, you know, taking up the reins and, um, you know, trying to salvage what there is left of everything, because a lot of people ordered merch. A lot of bands tour, a lot of bands get their, you know, merch through them. Yep. So I can only imagine what the hell they're going through over there right now, too. Yeah, yeah, us, us included. We we get our merch through Indie Merch, and they've always taken care of us. So, yeah, if you guys want to support Suffocation, definitely hit the Indie Merch page. Pick up fucking every T-shirt, buy all their records. They <laughs> are all fucking If you didn't buy them already. Slappers. Yeah, if you didn't buy them already. Or download it, you know, because that's better. <laughs> So, so you're obviously in New York right now, you know, yeah. on Long Island, the, the epicenter, if, if you will. So have, are you, you're born and raised a uh, New Yorker? Yeah. Yeah. John, man, I've been, uh, I've been born and raised here on Long Island my whole entire life. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people come from Long Island, you know, you got your Billy Joel's and you got your freaking Natalie Portman's and your Rosie O'Donnell's, yep. you know, you got all that <laughs> shit that comes out of, you know, 
that comes out and lives out here. You know, we've got that second richest place like Beverly Hills. We've got the Hamptons, you yeah. know. So, I mean, I very rarely ever go that far out east on Long Island anyway. But if I do, it's cool to go to the beaches, go to the wine vineyards out there on the North Fork, you know. So if you're ever out here when COVID-19 uh, decides to fucking take a hike, <laughs> you know, take your old lady and take her to the vineyards. It's really nice. Okay. But, um, yeah, I mean, it seems that things have leveled off. So for the last two days, we've, uh, you know, as far as the virus is concerned, we things are supposedly kind of leveled off but we never know like if it's ever going to pop up and be more so you know everybody's still on lockdown people very rarely go out you do see people that do go out obviously we can still go it's not like we have martial law where we're we're all under house quarantine and curfew yeah but um you know thank god for america with that but, yeah um, yeah seriously it, you know, it could be real, there's other countries that it's not like that so we have to take for granted that we can still go out to the fucking grocery store like when you really need something not like necessarily to go out there and just gallivant you know exactly but, uh, yeah it could be considerably worse but we we got to do worse. I mean, we know you know really what it comes down to is nobody here knew how bad it possibly could be until they started testing for it and obviously we have you know over the course of time we've gotten a lot more testing going on than the average yep so you're hearing more you know statistical numbers from us because we test more yeah, there's more tests, and, and the biggest yeah. thing is is that you can be asymptomatic and have it, so you could exactly. not have symptoms. That was the first thing I thought when I got home. I was like, me and my whole band, you know, we're like, none of us are going to go around and be out, <laughs> like, yeah. for at least, you know, two something weeks, because we don't know if we're just carrying it and spreading it to people. Like, we're out on the road all the time, so I guess we're exposed to a lot more germs, a lot more people. And over the course of time, you build up an immunity to it, but you you yeah. know you don't know if that's if that's what's going to do it. I think the last tour that I just did between Russia, which was freezing, yeah. you know, <laughs> snow out of snow, so crazy, dude, it was crazy. Holy shit! Yeah, dude, forget it. But um, you know, none of us even really got sick at all or the sniffles. So nice. That's a I, that's you know, I'm, I'm glad that I feel great, but I, <laughs> I was pretty worried, man, when I got home. I that I didn't want to spread it to anybody. I was going to say, I was, I was talking with somebody else on the podcast last week and we came up with that. We've seen enough grimy ass bathrooms that we just Probably. have, we just have natural immunities now. <laughs> exactly. You're exposed to it. It's like, you know, there are some people where that it just won't ever build up in their system and they're still going to get sick. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it, it's really, it's gotten kind of terrible to be honest with you, because look at what it did to everything in the country and the whole world, not just us. Yeah. So it fucking sucks, John. I want to go out on the road and play some shows with you. I know. I'm saying, man, we gotta we gotta get back at it. Fucking you know, do absolutely. Europe again. We gotta. I don't know where where, do, where the fuck should we go? Let's go to Japan. We haven't done Japan together yet. Let's do that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, I was slated to go to Japan at the end of the year. Well, hopefully, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, oh, everything shit. will pan out and be wonderful, man. You I know? hope so, man. I hope so. Japan's one of my I don't, favorite. I don't places. want the whole industry, the music industry. The, the grocery stores, the shipping industry, the bar industry, the restaurant industry. I don't want to see all of that go to shit over a fucking virus. Yeah. That's probably been around for a while anyway. Right. And we just didn't know it, you know? Yep. Until it got, it got out of control. And that, that's, that's a, been a big topic on, on the podcast. So it's, it's really how, how do we feel normal is gonna, is gonna look like, these, I, these years I, later, you know what I'm saying? I have a feeling it's going to be a little weird, John. A little weird for a little while anyway. Yeah. Kind of sucks because, like, you know, we like to all go to the shows. We like to go. I mean, you want to go to the movies. You want to do all that stuff. How's it going to be to, like, go to a movie theater and you got to sit fucking six feet away from the fucking person you sit next to, you know? Like, what the hell? It's, I don't know, man. Eventually, yeah, something's yeah. got to give. So, hopefully, it's like... I think that most of America is doing the right thing by doing the whole quarantining, you know, over the course of time, at least the last four weeks I've been home. But uh, I hope it, it pans out where this passes over and it's just something else. They get like a vaccine or something. Yeah, I hope so too, man. I, I really like, 
it, like I said, it's shit that we take for granted going to shows and being able to see your friends that come through when you're off tour or, or whatever you're doing. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, I'm relatively antisocial, but I'm still pretty social when it comes down to it. And, yeah. And you got to get out and see your boys. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got, you know, my dudes. <laughs> got some writing to do, you know? Uh, that That's... A, a positive from all this you got to try and find the silver linings with these situations right so we're finishing yeah, just, up a record are you guys working on some new shit oh yeah yeah we've got you know a whole bunch of songs in the works and even even though right now that we're not all together in the room jamming the way that we want to be we're doing things digital you know we're sending files back and forth to each other some of the guys that are still on long island every kind of like i don't know like let's say every couple of days they'll come by or whatever, and we'll sit and we'll just try to coerce what our ideas are together, and then you know send it across the world as well. Because as I said, <clears throat> my bass player is still in Germany and he's giving lessons, mind you, you guys. So look him up, Derek Boyer, if you guys want some video lessons or something. And um, and Eric is in Canada, and once they close the border to Canada, he hasn't been in the room, so he's doing his thing there and sending it to us. We're sending it out to each other. And we're just compiling everything until we can all get back into the room together and really, really congeal all of our songs. We have a lot of material. We just have to put it all together, together, you know, with the band together. Yeah, yeah. You got to be able to yeah, sit know, in the room or like get in the studio. And, and so we're lucky, you, you know, Tony, Tony's our drummer. He's he's doing yeah. our record. So we're supposed to be tracking. I love in. seeing Killian on, a, on a Davey 504. You saw that? You saw oh, that? Yeah. I, I, I lost my shit, man. Like, oh, yeah. And he, he got the, like, you know. The nod of approval. The, yeah, he got the approval, man. Home Skillet's killing it. Man. Oh, yeah. Like, Killing's a little shredder, dude. Freaking shredder, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you guys are looking for some lessons, Derek Boyer, bass player of Suffocation, is doing video bass, lessons. Yeah, page, you know. Hit him up. I know he's got Instagram and Facebook and, and all that cool shit. Yeah, man. He's doing it. So, dude, tell me tell me how you how you started up w with Suffocation and, and where... I, like I told you before, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and call <laughs> you guys the fucking... The, the godfathers of Slam, the pioneers. Oh, and that's not just oh. me. That's anybody I talk with that I say, yo, we're going out on tour with Suffocation. And they just like are like, holy fuck, the pioneers what? of Slam. And... Well, I mean, obviously it wasn't just me. There was a lot of people involved in the beginning, but uh, yeah, like really in like '88, like maybe '87, '88. You know, we had Josh Barron, who's in Australia now. Um, you know, Guy Marche, who's living in North Carolina, who's you know a part of Suffo era, obviously. Yep. Um, a couple of other people. We were all like really young, so we were bouncing around, jamming with each other. Chris Basile from Pyrexia. You know, we had tried all these different lineups throughout the course of going through high school, and I guess the suffocation name actually fit. And, you know, Josh and Nems had a couple of people that were playing, and one guy couldn't really play, so I had popped in at that point, even though I had still been jamming with all those different musicians, like, out of high school, yeah. you know? So, uh, you know, me and Frank and Josh were sitting at the mall, and Frank was like, look, look, you know, we're at the food court being fucking mall rats at the time. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he's like, well, let's name the band Suffocation. We're like, okay, and that was it, like, Sick. from that point. And, you know, we did do a demo. We did do, you know, the EP. Yep. And, um, you know, from that, it was basically history. You know, we've had a lot, a lot of changes and things like that through the years. But we still, you know, we still kind of keep it heavy. I still talk to the majority of uh, the all, all the former lineups uh, still to today, which is a good thing. And, you know, the years have made things a little bit, I guess more nicer and more copacetic amongst members, which is good. Yeah. You know? But right now I got a great lineup, dude. Probably the best one I've had, at least me being in this band from that point. And which was forget it, thirty something years ago. Yeah, dude. And uh, I will give a shout out myself to the new lineup, Ricky and Charlie fucking killing it. Oh every yeah. single show. Eric, man. Eric, Adam, Eric as killing. well, yeah. The guys are the guys are really doing uh they're really doing a great job. They're really going ballistic. I mean, we've been having really good times. Um, Eric is I a think, monster, I, dude. Just watching him yeah, on that last I, tour that we did. Absolute freak. He's one of those idiot savant people, man. I swear <laughs> to God. Hey, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the guy's stupid, but he just, there's certain <laughs> things that he'll overlook, and then you realize how much of a monster he really is. 
and you're like, oh, okay, now I see where all that juice went. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it all went to his playing. It's kind of like it's kind of like seeing Trey from Morbid Angel, you know? Yeah, he's like the most melted human being in the world, and then he totally shreds it. You know, <laughs> but Eric's definitely not in in that same category. Eric is really he's fantastic. He's incredible, dude. He's he's got whatever it is, dude. He's he's fucking got it. Like yeah. he really crushes is. those fucking songs. Yeah, awesome. Man. Yeah, man he's very good very adept and you know you know what's really good about eric i mean you know every band that plays live i mean always runs into something where it's like especially us because we're not like playing the click tracks and things like that yeah it's all memory you know what i mean yep so, i mean even if something were to fuck up it's like a drum trigger will fall out um a guitar cable will go somewhere um you know it could be anything um, he never he never fucks up like he he literally <laughs> just knows where he is in the song and if something goes wrong he's instantly back in it which i think every like like really good live musician knows what i'm talking about oh yeah where things just train wreck the fuck out and nobody can hear things like he he's very on point with that and I, i'm i'm really happy to have somebody who's like that playing drums yeah okay. dude we we've all been there and and i'm i think derek roddy said it and my bad derek if i'm if i'm misquoting you but your band is only as good as your drummer. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, you know, he's a drummer. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, but I, I felt that I was like, because I've, you know, just. True, though. I mean, you know, we all look at it now. But in this day, day and age, it's kind of rough because, you know, unless a drummer is actually really good, you don't know from the recording because now there's so much editing involved that it just, you just don't know if the drummer is really good. Until that's you see fair. Him. Yep. Yep. You that's know, fair. So. You know, it's those pioneers like the Pete Sandoval's and, and you know, people like that that really, you know, you can't, they're pretty unfuckwithable, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. At least in my opinion, I'm an old schooler. No, you know? no, you're, you're, you're fucking totally right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just seeing, so Effigy of the Forgotten Man, that, that shit turns 30 next year. How, how's that, how's that feel for you, dude? Um, it feels like I got more gray hair. <laughs> And uh, less a little bit. Hair. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it's really cool. I mean, I never, I never would have thought in a million years that you know anybody would appreciate that record or any of our records to the extent that they have, and it showed support. So thank you, the world. Thank you, everybody, for even paying attention to us. I mean, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool fucking thing to to like actually have happen, you know. And uh, you know, I'm glad you guys appreciate it, you know, because I turned 21. Recording that record, after Gina forgot. So fucking wild, dude. Like, yeah, just so for <laughs> me, it's like, oh shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, and and on the tours, it's it's so sick to see people just lose their fucking minds when you play songs off of that record. And... Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because you know, with the newer members, I mean, Eric's been in the band like four four years, five years now. Yep. Charlie's been in it four or five years now, so maybe even longer, like six. Yeah. You know, and. <clears throat> They always want to play those old songs, like where I'm just so sick of playing the oldies. But <laughs> it's like, oh, dude, I gotta play "Infecting the Crips" again. <laughs> yeah. That's how I, I feel like for it OG members of bands. You. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show you the time, the place, and the band that actually did something great. So, I'm I'm happy for all of them that they were even a part of it. You know? Yeah, yeah, and and people are are I see just as stoked on the new shit too. So it's not just the old shit, you know what I mean? And and that's always you guys are doing a fucking fantastic job. I'm gonna peep into the comments really quick because we've had some some movement over here. So Derek Ryan says, "Thank you for helping create brutal death metal and slam." Hey Derek, thank you, homie. Thank you for being there with us. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, we won't let you down. As soon as this shit's over, we'll be back out there with you guys. Fuck yeah! And and Tony Tony from Abiotic is actually hanging out. He says your oh, band. Heck. He says your band is only as good as your drummer. Fuck, we must really suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you gotta remember, dr drummers only got forty rudiments. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we've got modes and scales and all sorts of numerical little data that we have to think of. So it's a different ball game. But yeah, each yeah. to his own. They're both equally fucking tough. So face Agreed. it, that's the way it is. Now Tony, Tony's the man. Tony's talking shit. Uh, <laughs> Jeannie's in the in the chat, and she says to ask you who makes the best tour cookies. <laughs> well, of course, Chet makes the best tour cookies. <laughs> of course, she does. 
Jesus Christ, I had to hide them just so I'd have some. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a question, and, and I'm hoping we get some more of these questions in here. So Those three, yeah, those three chocolate cookie things were amazing. Anyway. <laughs> So Paul Paul uh, Oster, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right. He says, overall, what's your favorite record to jam out to from your own discography? Like, what, what's your favorite that you've written and you've? Um, I mean, obviously, I, I think the top the top one would be um, Pierce from Within. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple of songs and riffs that like maybe we don't play live, but just the actual songwriting of it, like at the time for me, was like interesting. And I I go back every now and then and just hack away on it and just play those riffs. So I think it would be Pierce. My next one though, the next of the newer generations of record would be Pinnacle of Bedlam. Yeah. It's an awesome record. I hope you guys like it. Davey Carl Ross did a great job on that record. That one is fucking really, really sick. I like it, man, for me. I like it a lot. I mean, nice, for man. my own self and bullshit, you know? No, no, I mean, you know. I you actually mean... hate everything I write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you gotta do like everybody says, it's just like, no, no, this record is actually, this new one is better than all the other ones. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. No, I don't, no, don't want to make any punches or surprises. You know, we keep up with the times and we also, you know, we want to keep the old school stuff alive and uh, make sure that we don't really change our methods of, uh, of what suffocation was and the formulas that we produced and made even in the newer lineups. I mean, now Derek's been with me for a billion years as well. So Yeah, yeah. It's kind no, of you, guys, you guys you guys have been fucking doing it, man. It's great. So what uh what what's some new shit that you're jamming? Are there any new bands in your in your playlist? Um, I mean, you know, I listen to a lot of stuff. I listen to Mr. Pavonic and the False Prophet. You know, I've been listening to Devangelic. Um, you know, of course I, I go with all the oldies but goodies just like you guys. I'm do I like faceless, you know, Sick. abiotic. I usually go a lot more back to the older, older stuff. I do like a lot of black metal too, like Norgeville. Um, I've been listening to them, Dark Funeral, lately nice. quite a bit. Um, I like a lot of the American metal, obviously, as you can tell, like the Immolation, um, you know, Malevolent Creation, um, Macabre. Um, oh, sick, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, Aeon, Prophecy, just like a, a lot of different bands that, uh, you know, I've had the honor of even working with, like uh, Profanity from Germany. Big up to Tom Sartre, he's a great fan. He's just a diehard guitar player, fucking great guys. Um, he hit me up he, and told me he was way stoked to like see us talk. Yeah, I love that guy. <laughs> he's, he's one of the he's one of the better dudes out there. And um, you know, give it up to Mike Von Eich. You know, those guys are like the most diehard Daniel Castellanos, my man Christian Scabones. Those are like the most diehard dudes. Like on Suffocation, I probably ever met in my life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so big up to them. Big up to Jet for the tour cookies. I love them. And big up to you, John, man. I mean, you know, this wasn't, Aww. we didn't do just one tour, we did two. And I'm really glad that you're doing a podcast for me. I don't have that much uh, time or effort to to put into this stuff. So, um, you know, I'm too busy sitting here trying to create and write and make sure that <laughs> shit's right. You Dude. know, if you want to this stuff, it's, it gets difficult after time. I just want to be a guitar player, you know? Yeah, man. It means the world to me that you come on. It means... It means yeah. more than you can probably ever imagine that you even think to like look out for us, dude. Just yeah, to, you, you took us out to Europe and you took us out on a U.S. tour and and that just that I I know I can hit you up and you're like fucking matos, I got you and and that's it's insane. Like if you would have asked me like, oh, you know, you're gonna be fucking homies with Terrence like five years ago, I'd have been laughing in your face, man. So this is hey, way I mean, sick. <laughs> that's cool, John. You know, it's not many people that move from Florida up to the north, up to the north, you know? Well, yeah, dude. Are, so, you know, <laughs> looks like times are changing, brother. <laughs> yeah, legit. And I'm, I'm so glad I did. And this will be a, a good segue for us to to get to talking some northeast uh, yeah, mar I mean, marijuanas. Like way, bro, so. I know. And, and I haven't been able to get out to a Hobbs Fest, which, like, is really upsetting for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to put that on hold for a while because once this right now... <laughs> Right now, I mean, with this virus, we don't know how long it's going to last. You know, we got a record that we're writing. We had a lot of touring set up throughout the course of the year. And, like, it, it's still it's still up in the air, you know what I mean? We don't know if things are going to are gonna happen. So I can't say that things are canceled. I can't say that things are still going on. I just have to wait it out. With this, it's a big setback. So to have Hobbs Fest and have fun, that's one thing. But yeah. to really just pay attention to what business is and try to, like, 
get back with the people that you already made plans with and everything else, man, it's been a little fucked up. Man. Yeah, dude. But I think I'm, I'm confident that, that things will, will get back to for yeah, us I for in the so. music industry. I think, I think it's going to be a boom. I, th- I really yeah. think it's going to be a boom because once, you know, like let's say 500 capacity places can open back up. Yep. All these bands are going to have all new material, be itching to go out. Oh yeah. Everybody's going to want to go out to the shows. If the bands do low ticket prices and the promoters and all that, it could really fucking surge the, the market for, you know, entertainment. And I hope that's what happens, man. So I'm crossing my fucking fingers. Me too. And I think we're going to get some of the best shows we've ever seen because we're going to get bands yeah. that, again... People that really appreciate the fact they can go back out and do this shit. Exactly. Know? People that may probably even unconsciously were taking this shit for granted a little bit and then yeah. seeing, wow, this shit could just go away at any minute. At, so, any, at any minute at this point. Yeah, yeah. man. So... But yeah, dude. So so I've had the opportunity to fucking smoke weed with you, yep, all well, over Europe, in, yeah. in the Still U.S. Still smoking weed with you, John. Yeah, yeah. And we we never got into some of the nitty gritty on that shit. So you, dude, you're like, <laughs> I thought getting started with this, I made some connections in the U.S. and shit. So I've I've got my people that I smoke with in every yep. state and whatever. When I toured with you, I was like. I don't got shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got shit. I mean, you know, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I seen, I seen dudes bring you sacks that I was just like, all right. <laughs> People that you know, like, and that you really, you know, you make friends with them over 30 years. I mean, I've toured the States a lot. Yeah, man. So, you know, it's the same familiar people and we all know what's going to go on. So. You know, and, it's only weed brings us together, right? That's that's yeah, for, for me anyway. That, that's how I've met you know, some of my best friends. I gotta, I gotta do another shameless plug for uh, Kush Mountain out in California. My buddy Bobby from Possessed, get it? Them dudes are holding it down just like you're holding it down up there. Oh, yeah, like, you know, I gotta give it up to Leonard and this file of carnage dudes. Oh, come fuck on, yeah. man, you oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> so, man, so what's your what's your favorite? shit? You have a strain that that that's your favorite, uh, or you like indica sativa? My my favorite strain is called weed. And <laughs> I mean, I don't have one in particular favorite strain that okay. I can even say because now at this point, there's so many different names. I don't know which one's actually what. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> That's and, fair. I mean, unless I go to a dispensary to get it and it's like, you know, even at that point, you don't even know if the strains that they're growing are the strains that are supposed to be what they are you know that's true Granted, that's true they're probably strong but you don't know if that's really what it is yep you don't know if they fucking injected that shit with some steroids or some some other bullshit so either way that you look at it my favorite is weed good old <laughs> grown weed out of the earth i oh, love yeah. it i mean but i mean granted i like my indicas i like my cushion i like all weed i like sativa i like to eat it i like to have it in my tea if i can <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, they, it cures certain kinds of cancer. I mean, what's wrong with weed, you know? Yeah. It yeah. stops people from going crazy from being on lockdown and hibernation for the last fucking, you know, two months. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know? So so if you're weed, just tuning into the show for the first time. Domestic violence go up, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I manage a dispensary and we've been busier than ever. And yeah. just gr- super grateful to be able to work in the industry and, and – help people through this through this time we, we've got a lot of grateful patients coming good in for and you, John. good for you man it's pretty for sick I, i'm super fortunate to be able to so my dream job is obviously to tour in a band and then my other dream job is to work at a dispensary so it's it looks like you got it looks like you got shit made there johnny boy hey it's <laughs> it's uh, i'm grateful and trying to hang on to the shit dude <laughs> do, do whatever hey, i can only, to hang on to as long happy as is what makes you happy brother you know what i mean Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Word, dude. So, what what else is going on with you guys as far as your gear and shit? What what are you using now? I know you were oh, trying man. out some new guitars. What what are you uh, rocking? Yeah. Now? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, I my mainstay is always BC Rich. I've got my Scott from Varnix, which you know he's a custom builder. His band, False Prophet, awesome band. You guys should check him out. Um, you know, he, he's just an independent luthier. I do have another guitar from another company um, called LMD. 
Legator I'm not working with really anymore. Um, I don't know. I'm just stuck on I'm stuck on my my warlock shape. I just it's just something that's a go to for me. I guess I since I've been playing them for you know, twenty five years, thirty years or something now, you know, I, I'm just stuck on that warlock shape. Yeah, that's um, yeah, part as, of the Terrence image, man. Yeah, as far <laughs> as like as far as effects processing and stuff, which I don't use that much of. I have an Eventide H9000. Thank you, Eventide. You guys rule. Um, you know, best harmonizers and effects probably in the market. I also have TC Electronics. Um, I have a G system, G major two, which I use every now and then. I don't use it that often. Um, um, you know, an avid PV user. I've been a PV user since I was a little kid. So I've had everything from small, tiny amps to, um, to, you know, stack 6505s, 5150s, 3120s. Um, right now, I, I'm actually just running two heads because, you know, I had to downsize a little bit. I was getting fucking, I'm getting old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> lugging, lugging fucking 18 amps is, uh, is a pain in the ass, let alone just space. I just don't have a lot of space for it. Um, yeah, it is. Jesus. <laughs> you know, but PV has been a diehard, a diehard, uh, staple in my life and I, I can't say more than that as far as guitar strings the dario who's kicking ass um you know a great company they're out here on long island they make the best strings i think in my opinion um and they're actually helping covid uh they're making masks face shield masks now for people which i think is awesome whoa that's sick the dario fucking awesome company i didn't know uh, that yeah, I mean, you know, we're using Intune picks. Um, what else am I using? You know, I've still got my share of Vader cabinets and PV cabinets. And, uh, you know, uh, that's pretty much what I'm running in general. Like, at home, I'm just running a 6505 stack, my Eventide. Um, you know, maybe my G system just to use it more as a MIDI controller than an effects processor. And, uh, and rock it from there, you know? Fuck yeah, yeah. I've I've seen all that shit that you're using live, and yeah. it sounds fucking crushing. PV provided the backline. Awesome. I got I big up to them, man. I yeah, they that. provided the backline on that last tour, and yeah. that that was sick. Very cool, man. See you guys fucking rocking it. So, <laughs> so um, obviously inspirations have changed from from when you guys got started up until now. Yeah. What are what do you what are some of the the bands that are still inspiring you to 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 write and, and keep doing the shit? Well, I, I mean, for me, it's I mean, there's still a lot of bands that are that are you know going strong that I still love to death. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, there's no way I'm going to take anything away from the Morbid Angels. I like the new David Vincent project, Ultimus. You know, Cryptopsy's still kicking it. I mean, Fuck they yeah. always fight through. They always write brutal cattle decapitations, just fucking crushing it. Oh man. You know, I mean, um, you know, there's just so many bands that I listen to and that I've listened to over the course of the years that um it would be just impossible to name them all. And I mean, yeah. off the top <laughs> of my head, they're just, you know, so creative, but also still a lot of the older school stuff, you know. I'm still into the old um, you know, Black Sabbath. Um, you know, the Black Sabbath with Ian Gillian is and the one with uh Dio. You know, like mob rules, shit like that. Um, fucking great records, man. Real inspirational. Always back down to the Randy Rhodes and Ingvay Malmsteens. Oh yeah, hell yeah. Uh, you know, like Revocation, Dave Davidson. That guy is fucking just killing it on guitar. That guy is incredible, you know, dude. Incredible. Big up to what Nevermore always was. I mean, they fucking killed the game. You know, there's just so many. There's so many bands that are influential, and it's like. <clears throat> look at what what Tosin Abasi is doing with Animals as Leaders, even though it's not like, you know, blatant death metal. The guy is a phenomenal musician. Yep. Everybody in the band is phenomenal. I mean, you know, that that in itself is inspirational, you know. That's so, sick. I mean, it's yeah, sick to I mean, hear that you've got such a wide variety of in inspiration. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I mean, there's a reason that there's little switches on my guitars and things. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, granted, I play suffocation and I'm looking to go heavy and you know, play speedy fast and some tech riffs and stuff like that. But yeah, I also still like other kinds of music. And if my instrument can't kind of portray that when I just want to do it at home, you know, for myself, because that's why we really write music. It's for ourselves. It's exactly. Not, you know, it's not really for the for the world to determine what the fuck you're writing, what you're doing. 
Exactly. So, you know, I flick those switches, I'll make that thing sound like a Telecaster and I'm having a great time playing along with the television, <laughs> you know? And that's, that's one thing I would tell anybody who's a musician, go ahead, turn on the TV and plug in your amp and play along to whatever's fucking playing on the TV. Like, it was great for me when I was a kid, Tom and Jerry and like all those <laughs> old school cartoons oh, had all this great classical music on it. And to just be able to improvise and learn like certain things on it, yeah. like it, it just, it really, it, it, it paved the way for me and looking at things differently and writing and how I approach music. You know? That's so sick, dude. I never would have thought that even that kind of shit played a part in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, some of my friends, like when I was a kid and I really didn't play, I had to have been like maybe 13 years old or something, you know, and these guys were in high school and they would play guitar and they lived around the block from me. Yep. And these guys would just rip up like, you know, all sorts of old school shit. You know, song remains the same, Led Zeppelin, oh, nice. you know, things like that. And I mean, they were really adept at playing at that point in time. So you got to figure I'm 50. They're probably like 70, you know? Whoa, shit. <laughs> yeah, they're probably at this point. And that's <laughs> what they would do. They would be like, yeah, man, we just played in the TV. So I kind of picked up that idea from that. And it actually helped, you know, it helped to develop at least what I like to play at my own style, you know? Nice. Was was your family supportive of, of this shit? Like you you said you yeah. started playing pretty early? Yeah, actually they were. I mean, I, I had my first acoustic at seven and I smashed it by eight oh, because no. I thought I was I was in the hood. And then maybe <laughs> at about ten or eleven years old, I got another guitar from a friend around the corner. And at thirteen is when I got my first warlock. And at oh, that point yeah. I was just like I was fucking hooked. Yep. So all throughout high school I just locked myself in my room and played guitar you know so in high school is when i met you know mike smith frank mullen doug cerrito all those guys from the original lineups josh baron i went to school with and uh you know from there that's you know basically what i ended up doing bro. yeah you know? how did how did they feel about about the genre and about you touring so like for me for example i'm Hispanic, obviously, I'm the only fucking metalhead in my whole family, and obviously I'm Hispanic, so there's a lot of us. So <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like the, the outcast, if you will. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it was, was that similar for you? Do you have family that's into metal? Were they like? I mean, you know, for for the most part, they just knew I was into music, and you know, my sister's a singer as well. My brother's a dance instructor, always has been his whole life for like... Oh, no shit. You know, yeah, because that whole disco, he's older than me, so that whole disco generation was his style of thing. So we all did something like kind of arts and like kind of like crafts, you know, crafts, entertainment, something to that effect. Yep. And, um, you know, just did it for fun. So I think once I really took a liking to Beyond Dirt Bikes, playing guitars, um... <laughs> <laughs> My folks were like, well, it looks like you think he found his niche and we'll support him with that. So they were really very supportive of me, you know, that's, and still to this day, like my sisters and things like that, my brother-in-laws, they all come out to the shows if we're playing local. That's so yeah. sick. Yeah, it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I never would have thought, you know, but fucking hey. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how <laughs> I feel about it too. And, and my parents grew up in late 70s and 80s and they grew up in Miami, so they were very fucking 80s. Miami right. dance and and hip hop and yeah. shit like that. So yeah, I mean, it'd probably be funny. My brother probably taught them like you know dance moves. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> he flies yeah. down there. He flies down there all the time. You know, all, the, all the clubs and shit. And would dance. not would not be surprised. Yeah, Dude, he does, so he, he does it in the competitions and all that shit. I, I can't do that. That's so sick, man. That's that's fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Runs runs <laughs> in your runs in your blood. It seems I'm I'm really the only quote unquote performer in 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 the family. So it's yeah well the rest of the family's missing out aren't they yeah yeah hell yeah they are <laughs> you know what i mean so what well, would you say know. do you have any do you have any tours that that stick out to you as like a favorite or just or any places that you really like every time you 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 know you tour you're like hey we got a fucking hit I, here yeah i mean there's 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 obviously more than one i mean you know japan is an amazing place yeah you can't even you can't even like it's like, if you want to go to a favorite place, yeah, Japan, it's like one of my favorite places. Oh, yeah. I really oh, yeah. like, I, the whole world is fucking awesome, mind you guys. <laughs> so there's like great places in Canada, like Montreal that I love to go to in Toronto. 
Um, I love Mexico. Mex uh, we just did a tour with Incantation in Mexico previous to nice. us nice. going to Russia and stuff, and it was fucking awesome. I mean, I love the food there. It's like, I'll go there just for the fucking food. Like, if I could just go to Mexico for the food, I would. Oh, hell it yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> if any time I got the munchies, fucking street tacos, ah, so good. Anyway, um, you know, I, that's a great place. You know, obviously overseas, I love Barcelona. Um, you know, Catalonia, if that's what you want to call it, Spain. Yeah. Um, you know, it's beautiful over there. Of course, I love the Netherlands. Um, you know, I love Denmark. I love Christiana, you know. You go to Denmark, the little fucking the coffee shops. Little village inside there, the little the army village that's in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's some amazing shit. Um, you know, there's really a lot of places that I could say are my favorite. I mean, I love California, too. I love Colorado. Those places are fantastic. Even Massachusetts, you know, playing up there is... I've had great times. As far as tours, I mean, most of them are a blur now because I've done so many of them. Like, <laughs> you know, if there's something that just pops in my head from a tour story, I'll tell you. But um, yeah, I mean, those places are some of my favorites by far. I mean, you know, I love going to Rome. Um, you know, I love being out there. I mean, Ukraine, I haven't been there in God knows how long. I wish I could go back there. I was hoping that we'd have a show there, but then, you know, there's always some tension in the world that fucks things up. I yeah, mean, UK yeah. is great. You go and play London, the underworld is fucking fantastic. Always a good time there. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of places, man. There's a lot of places in this fucking noggin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I really we've love been fucking friends. everywhere. It's hard to, hard yeah. to choose, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's like, this really kind of hurts that I, I don't have the opportunity to like, you know, it, even just doing music because I love to do music and so does my band. You know, you meet so many people around the world like that are just, you know, awesome people. You keep seeing them over and over and over again. They're at your shows. They help you out. Like, yep. they're just, you know, they're the most fucking best people. And then, you know, you travel back and forth and you see them. They travel back and forth and see you. And it really, it, it's it's a great feeling to know that, you know, not only the people that are on your Facebook that are your fans, they're they're your friends, you know? It's fucking cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Making making friends with, with those people that come and right. see you over and over again over the years where it, yeah. it's, it's like, you're like, oh, I'm going here, fuck yeah, I'm going to see this guy and we're going to fucking hang and we're going to eat. Exactly. Do, 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 do. Yo, Lamb, what's up? We're coming. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Bring, like, the, you bring the weed. <laughs> see you next time. Oh, yeah. Well, Terrence, dude, thank you so much for fucking hanging. I love you. You are a personal you, idol for me, man. And yes. it's been awesome just getting to know you, getting to play shows with you, and course, getting some some more insight into into the mind of, of Big Terrence. Eh, well, you know where I'm at, bro. I'm not that far away from you. I'm only four hours away. So. No, once once all this shit clears up, if we're not playing shows, I'm coming down. Yeah, and we're, we got to get up. We're, we're getting up for sure. Anything you want to plug before we, we wrap this up? Anything else, Suffo wise that you guys got going um, on? I just want to say thank you to, uh, you know, to the Flaming Arts Agency over there. That was the, you know, the, the promoter and booking agent who set up our last store. I mean, you know, everything got cut off in the middle. He's been working his ass off. Thank you to him. Thank you to EMG. Thank you to PV, Evan Tide. Um, thank you to my band. Thank you, America, for fucking trying to keep us safe. Um, and thank you to all the fans, you know, we really, we've never as a band and me personally as myself have never had to cancel anything quite in, under such an uh, extreme circumstance. And we hope we never have to again, um, you know, always support the local scene. Thank you for supporting us through this all too. Um, I hope you all stay safe, mind your distance, and we'll be back as soon as we can, you guys. Thanks so much, Terrence. We'll we'll catch up soon, my dude. All right, brother, man. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon, man. Be good. Peace. All right, guys. Thank you so much for hanging. That was my good friend, Terrence Hobbs of Suffocation. So now if you'll give me just a few minutes here, we're going to take a about two-minute break, and I'm going to bring on Zach Householder of Whitechapel. So don't go anywhere. If you're in the live stream, stick around. Put your questions in there for Zach. 
and we will try and get to as many as we can throughout the interview but give us just a couple minutes and we will be back All right, ladies and gents, we are back on the Big Shred podcast. Thanks for bearing with me while we took a couple minute break so I could crack open one of these. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Terrence. So we will get right into it. Our next guest is Zach Householder of Whitechapel and bring Zach on here. Zach, how the hell are you, dude? living the dream man what's up <laughs> hanging man hell yeah well thank you so much for coming on really appreciate it and just stoked to be able to get to talk to you and, and get to talk some white chapel tonight man of course man of course uh no nah, it'll be you know I'll, I'll go over what i can as far as uh as far as uh getting i don't know letting everybody kind of know what we've been doing while we've been at home and everything yeah, yeah. So how how's this whole shit been impacting you? How's the quarantine been treating you? What's what's your routine looking like if it's changed? <laughs> uh, um, well, it's not crazy different from what it was. I mean, I uh, I don't I don't go out as much as I used to, I guess. But I mean, you know, it's just I'm just like everyone. You know, I'd, instead of going to the grocery store and trying to keep everything, you know everyone's separated and all that like i'll you know i'll pay a little extra to have some groceries delivered and stuff as much as i can and uh i've literally seen myself and my girlfriend for the past like four weeks and uh my brother lives a few houses down i've seen him and the only places he's been is you know my parents and here and it kind of sucks for my parents because yeah i haven't got to see them but they've my mom was also an x-ray tech so oh, she's wow. yeah she works at like one of the bigger hospitals around here and She's on the front lines of that shit, man, and she's like, in her, she's in her sixties, so it's uh. Holy shit. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I mean, they they take the precautions, obviously, you know, but uh, she's, she's still rocking and rolling. You can't tell somebody like that to not go help people, you know. That's why they got it to begin with. Like people, people like that are coming out of retirement to go help, you know, with all with everything that's going on. So, even if I wanted her to not go, you know, I wouldn't ask her because I know that's not her mo. 
Dude, that's incredible. Please send her all of our love and, and thanks for, for doing that. That's it, it's in the interviews that I've done, there's seems to be almost always someone who is has a family member that is involved on the front lines somehow. And it, it's it's crazy how you're just like one step removed from someone who is out there helping people. And it's it's awesome. No, yeah. And and I mean, shit. My mom's got bigger balls than I do, so <laughs> and like she's yeah, she's the she raised three boys, so you can't you can't she's not gonna <laughs> you can't tell her what to do. Oh no, <laughs> yeah, my my mom is is pretty similar in 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 that fashion to it. She's she's setting her mind to something. You're not gonna be able to tell her shit. <laughs> well, what's uh what's your your like routine looking like on the quarantine are you still getting your workouts in and all that shit yeah i've got a uh luckily you know when we did like summer tours like warp tour and mayhem and stuff like that we had this little setup we would bring with us you know it's like a power rack that's portable and uh you know probably about roughly 380 400 pounds of weight uh to bring with and some and some basic stuff some dumbbells some bands and stuff and like Luckily, all that was at our building, including some of my stuff, and I just brought it back here to my house because no one else was using it, obviously. Uh, the, nice. The only, the only people that really used it were our old drummer, uh, you know, new guy, or Ben Harple Road. <laughs> new he, guy? <laughs> yeah, whatever the hell his name is anymore. Uh, <laughs> so he, you know, once he's gone, it hasn't really been touched, and I just brought it here and set up in our basement, and my girlfriend and I just, we just uh, work. I still get this. I mean, it's had to be adjusted a little bit, you know, because I can't yeah. use all the machines at the gym, but. Yeah, I still get the basic big three movements, you know, squat, deadlift, and bench, which is more than I can ask for. So, uh, still getting those in. Um, honestly, man, I'm taking the time. It's it stinks because everything is on sale right now. You know, gear, I know. everything, but I then know. I can't afford to buy anything because I can't go work. So, yep. and there's so much stuff I want to do to my house. Like I need this whole studio. I need to move it into another room, but I gotta treat that room and do some shit to it first, which I can't. You know, it's just everything's just on hold uh the only thing you know i'm still writing that we're writing for the next album right now Fuck and yeah. uh and we're doing all that and i've got some new stuff i'm trying out in the studio as far as tricks and just honestly i think i've just let days waste away of sitting here just like <laughs> man that snare snare sounds like shit and just the whole <laughs> day just waste the whole fucking day on a snare but I, you know it's just i don't know uh so yeah and i'm trying to do some work here and there you know it's like uh i try to get as much mixing and mastering work as i can but you know man i mean it's it's kind of when you're not when you're not out there like as far as like you know when you're not big time like sukoff or you know lewis or you know annie sneef and stuff like that it's right it's hard you know you haven't done anything reputable it's hard to get your name out there to actually like just yeah it might not you know i'm not saying i could not saying i could keep up with those guys but i you know it's hard to like prove to people that, like you know what I do all right. So if you want to do some work, <laughs> sure, but you got to show them work to begin with. The only thing I have is stuff of myself, and and then when I try to like record myself, to to you know it just never. I'm just like ah, eh, it sucks. I'd rather be recording somewhere else. So. Uh, you can't can't be too hard on yourself, and you uh, gotta you know it, it. It's it's the same thing putting it from a perspective of a band, right? And obviously, you guys are way successful in, in that regard. So it's you just gotta put some shit out sometimes and say, hey, this is this is what's going on, and this is where I'm at. This is what I got going. And so that being said, guys, if you've got some shit that you need mixed and mastered, hit Zach up. <laughs> Let them know. Let let the people know where they can reach you if 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 that's something that you're going to be doing during this off time. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I'll you know it's uh, Instagram is usually the best bet as far as like giving me a message on there, and then we'll you know then we'll go email from there and whatever. Uh, but yeah, uh, that and I you know a lot of local people around here. I you know I'll, I'll work on their guitars and fix everything and do setups, electronic stuff, and you know I don't I don't do any like I don't do any like amp you know amp soldering and circuit board changing like that i'm not that i'm not an engineer but uh i can do biasing and you know change out tunes and stuff so just little you know stuff i've learned as a necessity over the past 14 years yeah being a band but it's it's become you know i've just gotten good at it because of that so or better than better than most at it let's put it that way nice nice 
Cool, man. So how is how's Tennessee? You're you're in Tennessee. You're still in Knoxville, right? Correct. Yes. How's how's Tennessee handling all this shit? Is is it? I haven't heard too much in the way of, of Tennessee. I have been following a little bit what Alex has been kind of shedding some light on as as far as how they're they're handling it. But how 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 do you feel about it? Um, I think our governor's an idiot. Yeah. You know, I'm uh I'm not in politics. I'm yeah. not I'm sure his job is hard. Yep. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying anyone can handle this perfectly. Uh no one knows how to do this the right way. What I do know is he he slacked in you know doing the mandatory stuff to keep it from spreading. He should have done it quicker. Yep. Uh and he was still allowing he's he's still allowing church to happen and uh wow. And from and my my girlfriend just texted me and she said uh, actually I was going to mention this she said um, that she is yeah our governor our governor Lee Knox County schools will remain closed through the end of 2019 and 2020 school year so wow I'm guessing all of next year after summer I don't guess anybody's going back to school which which to me and then i hear everybody talking about yeah everything's going to reopen at the beginning of may i'm like so why is everything going to reopen and start going going about your business again when we can't play shows for another year yep and and you know if we do it'll be like you know a 500 people in a thousand cat venue and stuff like that yeah so I don't, i'm just like i don't think that's going to happen anytime soon and maybe I, i'm I, i'm trying to like put it i'm put i'm trying to put all the pieces together and with Tennessee, I'm just like, you know, everybody's trying to go about their business. I'm like, it's not going to be that easy. I don't think. I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a process, man. If it's, if it's, you know, if it spreads like it does, and who knows? And there's tons of other theories out there that are that make my head spin. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get too too far into it. We're here to talk about positive stuff. So. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And I was just gonna say that it's there's there's a line of of being realistic, but also being positive too. So yeah. I can see where being optimistic can you know it can really it it can cause some not so great things to happen so you got to have that realism at least underlying you know yeah at least at this point anyway we've got a we've got a no i mean (laughs) you have no choice man otherwise you're going insane you know it's funny like the suicide rate in tennessee because this stuff has skyrocketed wow Um, yeah it's uh because you know people people are scared and people are out of work they can't you know i mean i've you know I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to be, you know, anytime soon, I'm sure it'll get sorted, but like, you know, unemployment for someone that's self-employed is, uh, is not heard of. So that's a new thing that's going to be happening. And the stimulus thing, like, right. I, I don't plan on seeing that anytime soon for someone like me. I mean, I, I pay taxes every year, but you know, who knows? Cause, uh, the IRS websites, you know, told us, told one of our members that they weren't eligible to get one. So what the fuck? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm sure it's just wrong. Um, I hope so, funny. dude. What the yeah, fuck? Yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens, man. Um, past that, though, that's why we're I don't know. That's why I feel lucky that we have the arts to try. And I mean, art art right now is what's getting people through this. Like artists in general, like hundred percent TV shows, movies, music. Like I've listened to a lot of music lately. Find a lot of new bands and all that stuff. So nice. Yeah. What what uh drop drop some names who who are you who are you checking out <laughs> uh i just today actually uh, um i've been meaning to check out this band i finally went through and listened to one of the albums a band called witchcraft cool uh they're like a it's kind of like a rock and roll vibe but it's really cool stuff them and uh what else have i listened to lately on uh i mean outside of the classics you know i've been jamming a lot of the a lot of the mashuga and the soil work and stuff like that just while i'm working out and everything and uh Fuck yeah but yeah, witchcraft and um, oh man, what was that other band? I, I found another band the other day that was I posted about on my story. I just cannot remember the name right now. But uh, <laughs> and the new Opeth album too, man. Holy cow! I I don't know. I those guys. Granted, one album might not be as good as the other, but they can never yep. do any wrong in my book. So <laughs> I agree, man. I agree. I feel like I haven't given this last one a fair listen just because things have been have been crazy. I heard the singles and was were was stoked on the singles. But I need to dive into that one because I've been hearing right. a lot of good things about it, even even with how obviously different that they've 
kind of gone with their with their sound, you know. I mean, but it's it's cool though. Like I want to I want to be I want to be a band like Opeth or Mastodon, you know. I, I want to morph as time goes on, and I want to still be part of what I am, but I want to grow. And like Mastodon did it beautifully, Opeth did it incredibly, you know. It's uh, oh yeah. I, yeah, I mean, well, we'll get to talking about that though, as far as the whole music thing. But yeah, we'll yeah we'll move on though. So. Yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, so, did you guys have to cancel any tours or postpone any tours through through all this? Absolutely. Uh, we had to cancel that European run we were about to do with the Empiricon Fest, and uh, we had a little oh. UK run lined up with this Carnet, which is kind of a bummer because that band is sick. They're, they're so, so cool. sick, dude. Yeah, they're incredible. Uh, then, and then we had a summer run that I don't think I can still really say much about yet. I don't know yeah. how much it was announced, but uh, we had a, a summer one in the summer that was going to happen that got moved. And uh, fuck, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do it to when they're moving it because we're trying to start recording an album in you know in the fall. Oh, nice. So the, we probably won't be on the road again until you know uh, early winter. You know, <laughs> so, uh, it may be the end of the year. So that's if they're allowing it by then so right so i'm uh and it, you know i've been investing a lot of money into my studio and everything and, and it, it was it wasn't like you know uh not thought out it was just you know okay i have consistent work right now i need to invest this while i can and then of course this happens i'm like well here we are <laughs> yeah uh, I'm, I'm sure you know there there are a lot of people in that same situation Oh, there are. I'm I'm no more special than anybody else, man. Some people, a lot of people, have it a lot harder than I do right now, and it's tough for everyone. And yeah, I just, I just, it just makes me sit here and go, well, um, you know, what can I contribute to society right now? <laughs> so sure. Yeah. Well, you can work on the new Whitechapel, man. That's no, I'm trying to, man. I'm. Uh, I've had a lot of writer's block, a lot of, a lot of hard, hard to find inspirations lately for. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's because of stress or it's just because like everything feels like it's been done you know it's just I, and right. i'm sitting here you know it's you can't compare yourself to people you know if you compare yourself to everybody on the internet you can't you know it's not healthy you can't do that like, yeah um but you know it's so hard when you have just really sick people on there you know just just ripping on guitar or making cool stuff <laughs> but how do you stand out now you know and uh you know the, the one thing that you know I, I feel like I've tried to learn is songcraft over the years not just having a cool part and going check it out cool part and then try to like actually write a cool song exactly so uh, you know I just have to tell myself that you know yeah I'm not I'm not out here you know playing uh, animals as leaders stuff on guitar but I mean I'm, <laughs> I mean I I love that stuff, but I just, you know, I'm not good at it. You know, I can't, I can't, uh, the, the hybrid picking and everything. I mean, I kind of learned guitar that way in a weird way, like holding the pick and using my fingers at the same time, but, yeah. uh, I've never really tried a lot of it. So I, I shouldn't say I can't, I've just never tried it. Um, that shit's hard, dude. I, I yeah, just started I, trying to get it into it a little bit. Cause I seen Scott from Fallujah is a fucking wizard with that shit. He's, it's, uh, he's not human. So. He's not <laughs> him and him and Joe from Psychroptic are not human people yeah uh, yeah joe and dave both actually from psychroptic they like joe is hands down one of the best guitar players i have ever seen um he he has some of the best technique and best right hand like if you ever hear him ch just do like chicken picking like bluegrass stuff yeah it's unreal how good that guy is that whole band they're they're so yeah, fucking they're, tight like it's incredible how tight they it's, are it's on um, yeah that band is unreal so uh but yeah, um, Rider's Walk's been a bitch, man. It's uh, it's just, you know, shit. We had that last album, man. It just seemed like, you know, it was, things were just falling in line, and it just it was a really good one. It's just hard to yeah. follow up that and be like, okay, we got to, you know, it's just like, okay, got to do the same thing, but better. One, two, three, go. <laughs> uh, no pressure. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you, you guys are... are pretty far along in your in your careers i guess as far as how many albums you've put out so correct me if i'm wrong you guys are six or seven uh, i think the valley was number seven 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 so oh, it'll close. be number it'll be number eight uh when the next album comes out be nice eight. so so how have you how have you gotten through that before did you feel that it was a little more i guess for lack of a better term like effortless trying to like quote unquote top the last album or uh, 
it, you really didn't. Well, it, yeah, it, it was it it was weird because I was always proud of our records, but like I wasn't super stoked on Mark of the Blade. I'll be honest. Like uh, I wasn't uh, super into it. It was a very rushed album. It was super rushed. Yeah. Uh, our producer had our engineer Mark. He had a lot of stuff on his plate. Uh, didn't have time to mix it. Uh, didn't get to send it off to get mastered by who he wanted to. And oh shit. And and, uh, and you know the recording process with our old drummer was a nightmare. Uh, it was not. It took like drums should have taken a week. They took like three weeks. Wow. Um, he fucking blew it on that one. He, the performances were great, but he was just he just ruined it. Uh, <laughs> and, and it screwed everything else up. You know what I'm saying? Like the timeline. So, yeah. Um, outside of that, man, like I was, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't super like I, I'm. I think there were stepping stones in the album. I think, uh, like, uh. Decidium and Bring Me Home were yep. big steps for us as far as a band goes. Like it was stepping stones in the right direction to make the valley happen. Yeah. Um, and I think I think Mark of the Blade had a lot of good material. It just needed fine tuning, and the production was not super stellar. It's super clean, but yep. it just wasn't. It just wasn't what it could have been. It's not that it was bad. It just could have been better. And uh, that's just a group. It was just a group collaborative, like, you know. Everything didn't fall in place for that album, but then the Valley it did, and it's hard to top that because the Valley is hands down probably the best album we have done to date. Yeah, I was gonna ask, is that is that your favorite? Would you say? Yeah, absolutely, it is nice. the best album we've ever done. Uh, and following it up, yeah, that's why there's pressure. It's hard. Uh, you know, following up like, you know, the other ones was just kind of like, okay, we're gonna do another album. You know, it's like whatever. But then we had something really special this time, and it was just. Uh, it's just it's gonna be hard to follow up it's um it's gonna be a test <laughs> well i've been jamming it and like i said i i personally know the feeling uh you know we're we're working on our third one and trying to up the ante for sure but i feel like you you're gonna put out what comes out what you're feeling at the time what's influencing you at the time what's what's going on at the time so for for what it's worth for on my end it's during the writing process anyway it's like giving yourself a little bit of like slack and and permission to fail permission to like just work on something and like get up and just write a riff and even if it's shit just work on it and then fine tune it and then even if it doesn't work out at least it's it helps getting the juices going a little bit and that's kind of how i've been approaching this finishing up our, our record and stuff and it's it's helped me with with my mindset of like being a little less hard on myself but i'm sure in when you're on your eighth record which i have no experience with obviously it's it's a it's a little bit of a different feeling well even my even my girlfriend gets on to me like i'm way too hard on myself and i need to like she's reading this book the art of not giving a fuck and, uh, <laughs> quoting a lot of it to me today and you know it's true like i give i think i care too much about of the stress of caring too much about having to please everyone yeah. even though i'm super i'm super against having to please everyone and i'd rather do what you know we feel is right for us but yeah still at the end of the day like i still want to make our fans happy so it's like you know it's you see you see everybody praising you know like the, the code orange and, and and knock loose type music and we're over here just like well you know that's that's fine that's absolutely fine and, and that's that's what they want to do but you know we're trying something a little different right then you have people that want us to keep doing you know shit that's like really dated i'm not saying their stuff's dated but you know if we were to go back and do a somatic type album it would just be super dated and yeah uh, it would have modern twists on it. i'm sure it would be done very well but it's just man how can you like how can you i mean you can only do the same thing so many times this genre that we're in i hate this made up genre I just i'm not into that <laughs> like i'm sorry i do not listen to death for it. i don't yeah. i i don't hate it i don't dislike any of it some of it's executed very very well and they're yep. good bands but uh when i started playing white chapel they started calling white chapel death core i just for me and them at the time they were friends of mine they played heavy shit and yeah. i knew them all from playing in you know bands in knoxville yeah and so in all this you know and death course started blowing up i was just not into pink squills and shit man like I, was, <laughs> I was never into it and Whitechapel was just more fun for me and i don't think i think that was goes with the whole band we didn't try to stick to the death core genre and we're just doing that more so now just trying to get out of it because it's just such a it's such a narrow 
narrow genre, man, and it is not fun. Like, you know, you can only go so fast and do so many. Like, Arcspire just pretty much ruined it for everyone. You know, you can, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can go faster than and be more technical than that. Like, and you have bands like Nile and Necrophages. Like, what can you? They're not deathcore, obviously, but like, yeah. But I mean, you know, how much more technical and brutal and fast can you get? You know, it's like try something different, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, exactly. And and there's always I, I feel like. I've seen whatever memes on online and shit where there's a band will put out a new album and it'll show that picture of the guy yelling at the screen like, this doesn't sound like their first record. And then you put out a new album that you try to make sound like your first record and they're like, well, this sounds like the first record. They're not doing anything different. Yeah. So a lot of times, you like you said before, you can't you can't please everyone, but there is it's that... Yeah, but there's the, there is that that fine line you have to kind of dance because even even we in our infancy uh, are are kind of going through it where we tried to do our first record was very much like kind of chaotic and and we'll say quote unquote more deathcore and breakdowny and stuff and then we tried to for our second record not not in in the Whitechapel vein I don't think but tried to like clean it up a little bit work on the composition a little bit more not just have like not just have some bullshit riff just to get to the next breakdown we tried to right. have it a little more well, i mean that was that was exile man to a t like it, it was just like there were some really cool parts and it made for some really memorable songs but yeah. you know it was just like lightning in a bottle right. and uh it yeah same thing it was just like just throwing random riffs and parts where we needed to fill space sometimes you know? yeah and uh that can but that's still a good element to writing music you know be yeah. be spontaneous with it but sometimes song craft is really important and you'll learn like you're saying you're learning that as you go on and you're polishing it more yep. you're polishing your your craft more and that's like more you know it's like if with us you, you know if i have to program another blast beat or a straight double bass <laughs> part it's like what i mean what am i doing different like a, and i'm you can still do that you can still utilize it you can still make parts work yeah, but it has to work, and it has the song has to call for it, and you shouldn't do it because it's like this is the style of music we play. This is what you should be doing. Like, you shouldn't do it because you feel like you have to. You should do it because you want to. And if like if it if it complements the music, that's perfect. And you know if you're playing something in the vein of deathcore or death metal, then yeah, blast beats are probably going to be on there. But yep. um, you know, try try changing it up a little bit don't do a straight american blast beat like you know alternate with the snare and the hi-hat like you know the euro uh, blast yeah well even just even this different styles of blast but like even like you know you can do like a uh like on an american blast you got like, back like do the accents like with the little flam on the snare yeah and like it accents part of the riff and it just changes up the blast beat it's just simple things like that that just kind of make things cooler and then throwing in a lot of triplets too triplets are fun so yeah yeah speaking of of blast beats and drummers what's uh what's it been like playing with rudy he's a lunatic <laughs> he's in he's incredible dude no no he's so good man he is literally like he's he's a fantastic drummer and i mean that's that's obvious you know and he's, he's a swell guy too man he's yeah. uh you know he's gonna help us with this this next album and uh killer you know ho hopefully he's gonna you know write some stuff some drums for it and track in the studio and stuff and we'll, we'll go from there and nice. i can't make a you know, I can't say whether or not he's gonna. He's kind of a, you know, he's kind of a freelance guy. He's with us right now, as yeah. far as, but you know, he still does work for other bands, and uh, we're just, we're just. It's like we've tried with a few drummers. You know, we tried with Ernie. Ernie was killer, man. Ernie's a great guy. Uh, he just didn't fit the, you know, after we toured him for a year, it just wasn't. We just knew it wasn't right. Yeah. And uh, we tried Chasen. Uh, Chasen is a great drummer, but he just didn't work out with us. Uh, we tried. Um, What's the who's the guy that just did the Beneath the Massacre? That young uh, Anthony Barone. Anthony, yeah, yeah. Anthony's Anthony's a good kid, man. Uh, he was just a little young for us. He's, uh, I think, as he gets older, he'll be a better drummer. He was just young. Uh, yep. He, he's 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 mastering his craft. He was just young at the time, and we just didn't need that. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, it was really cool to play with him, and I'm sure he. I hope he had fun, but uh, it just didn't fit. You know, I mean, that's just and and with Rudy so far, everything has fit. He's on top of it. He. He works with me when it comes to like getting shit taken care of before we go on tour as far as the live tracks and him awesome. practicing and yeah it's it's nice to have a drummer that's on top of the shit because i've never had that before so yeah yeah we so our drummer he's uh fairly new he's he's been in the band for a year and and he's a fucking he's a madman too where he's insane at drums he does production he does 
So having somebody like that in our corner who can really carry a heavy load and execute and that we can rely on is, is that's, I was just talking with Terrence about it too, because you know, their drummer, Eric in suffocation is super sick, but it's just being able to have a drummer that you can really rely on to, to execute is, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to say that I've been listening to you guys since 2008, probably. So I think right around when somatic dropped and obviously through this as exile and all the records and, and, I think for us as musicians, because it's we're a lot of us are trying to accomplish the same thing, which is not put out the same record every time you do one. Try and grow as a musician, as an artist, and really, like you said before, master your craft. So I can I've been able to personally really appreciate the steps that you guys were taking through every record. What what do you feel like contributed to the changes in the sound? Um, I think everybody, you know, kind of, I want to say everybody growing up, man, because the stuff you're into, like when you're a kid, you're just not into as you get older. I mean, it's like, let's be honest, man. You think Blink-182 would write the exact same album they did (laughs) 20 20 years ago? Like, I don't think so. Like, it's, you get older, man. And it's like on my birthday, I'd be, now I'd be stoked about getting a lawnmower. You think I'd be stoked about that when I was like 18 years old? (laughs) Dude. (laughs) So like. So same thing with the music, man. Uh, and and some people don't really grow out of it, and that's fine. But like, you get older, and it gets harder for me to listen to some of this stuff, man. And I'm not saying that in a bad way or like I'm over it. I just, I just like there's stuff I pay attention to now, and I just have different tastes. You get older, you just get different tastes, man. And I think that's the biggest part of the change in the sound. You know, we're all not listening to the super brutal death metal nonstop anymore. Uh, yep. And we're all experimenting. Like, I, you know, I listen to a lot of classic rock, man, and a lot of uh, a lot of not heavy. I mean, outside of the classic stuff, I go back and I'll always love and listen to. You know, I listen to a lot of uh, – it's like I've been going back and really appreciating the art of some of these older records from these older bands, like Judas Priest, and uh, it's like – it's like Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd is a band that I was never really, I never, never disliked them as far as musicians. They're phenomenal musicians. You can't say that. But, yeah. Uh, as far as music goes, it never really resonated with me. But as I get older and I listen to it more now, I'm like, I mean, listen to it more for the audio aspect. I'm like, this is phenomenal. It sounds incredible. Oh yeah. I'm not still not super huge in the music, but <laughs> but then you have like, you know, Painkiller by Judas Priest. That album still sounds good to this day. It's yep. cheesy. It's great, but like it still sounds good and so i'm getting older i'm like this is like i want to make my record have personality like this stuff and a lot of that's how you produce it how you record it too and uh that's why we you know we try to really go out our way to get some cool guitar tone and especially the drums the drums in this last album were so cool man they sounded so good um and that was naveen right that was naveen he's we all know he's phenomenal he's oh yeah He's unreal, man. He he did so good. Uh, and we all know, like you know, with drums, we wanted nothing sampled, nothing blended, nothing like that. So nice. we the biggest part of our budget went to a studio in Nashville. We used a room there. We used Warner Studios, and they had a lot of good hardware, a lot of good outboard gear. Uh, had a good desk. Um, and when I say desk, if anybody doesn't know, that's the the big soundboard uh, <laughs> they have at the studio in the studios and everything. But uh. And all that coloring from the analog, even though it goes to digital, that coloring from the analog is what made those drums sound like hi-fi audio, and it was so cool. The room sounded good, the mics were great, and it just like, man, I still have the stem or the the multi-track files from that album. You know, I use that to like go back and do some playthroughs sometimes, and I'm nice. like, God dang, these drums sounded so good. Even raw, they sounded cool, man. They had personality. He must and have been pers- so fucking stoked to be in that studio, man. <laughs> well, we, we we usually do a good a decent drum room uh yeah. for a studio but it's always been like you know uh, at uh audio hammer when they had the the old barn house yeah they're using it and then uh you know now mark's got his room in nashville and then jason's got his new drum room both of them are great but what you really miss out on is all that hardware at some of these studios now man like uh yeah like that like at warner studio they had so much cappy stuff and like you know this just super sick uh uh, preamps and you know all the all the all the mic freeze man it was just that's what made the record like that's what made it had that 
it just had that sound, man. It was good. Mark did a good job of like picking out the pre's and stuff to make it really what it was. And uh, being in that studio, yeah, actually, <laughs> that's where I got one of my preamps actually for a solid. The one I'm talking through the mic through. Yeah. Uh, they were selling some stuff, and I was and I was like, man, that's a cool preamp. And he's like, you want to buy it? I'm like, ah, you're kidding. And he gave me a sick deal on it. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going home with this. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Nice. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but uh. Yeah, that yeah, the, and that's what translated into the album, like sounding how it did, man. Uh, that album has personality, and you know, uh, David Castillo, uh, he he uh, he's a guy from Sweden. He's done like Leprous, uh, Demu, Opeth, and stuff like that. He's he, Cat, Catatonia. He does nice. them a lot. Oh shit! And, uh, he mixed our album. Uh, Mark engineered it with us, and then we sent it to Dave uh, to mix it and that's what really gave the album some some fucking personality man dave fucking killed it he did so good uh and then you know that he because he has a he has a desk there yep and you know everything gets summed down through his analog desk in his studio and then then gets sent off the mastering after he approved the mixes and then ted jensen mastered it and ted you know he's done like death tones and stuff like that and fuck yeah he dude his i'm sure his outboard gear that he uses for mastering is incredible and Every time we get a master, the past two albums, uh, not past two, Arnless War and this, uh, The Valley were mastered by Ted Jensen, and it's the best two albums, best two sounding albums we have. So the mastering makes a huge difference too. It so, does. Uh, so yeah, that the whole lineup for this last album was phenomenal. I think we're going to kind of go the same route, um, you know, as far as Mark helping and then Dave Castillo doing it, having his hands in it, and then send it off to Ted again. Nice man, yeah. If, if it ain't broke, right? Like if you guys find yeah, something right. that works, yeah. fucking exactly. hell yeah. So how does how does that stuff translate live? Because honestly, I had a chance to see you guys on that tour with it was Dying Fetus and Fallujah. I caught you guys at the Palladium. Oh yeah, yeah. I that. And I've been watching you guys for fucking years and years. I, my my first time catching you was back in Florida think it was at the culture room i don't know if you remember that venue oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> fun times at that venue but every time i saw you guys i was like wow this is the fucking best live like the best sounding live band i've ever heard and it was it was a big part of, in me like buying a kemper because i saw you guys rocking the kempers like from way back and i was like the guitars are fucking crushing like everything sounds so how does it when you guys you know record for a record how do you how do you figure how it's going to translate live you you have to take that into account to an extent um you know you you can't sit there and play like like lay on all these layers of course you you have backing audio uh, yeah is live to like help with some layers and stuff but you don't want to make something super like fake sounding that couldn't be done live and then of course how fast it is and how well it translates like um the stuff on the valley was really taken into consideration like how well it'll translate live and everything from that album so far is just probably some of the better translating stuff and let's be honest like you know stuff from the valley probably translates a lot better live than stuff from exile you know what i'm saying like right. it's just you have three guitar players doing some crazy shit super chaotic or you have it more thought out and yeah. more uh more laid back but still aggressive like there's a fine line so uh, yeah, everything in the valley translates live really, really well. Um, so it's it's done it's done it's done great, man. It's uh, like every we 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 still plan on doing like a full you know playthrough of that album at some point. Nice, because uh, it's it's definitely an album you can do like with a like an LED screen. You know, have the the themes and everything in the background. It would be really really cool. I think that's our goal as far yeah. as like getting there eventually, but uh, not yet. But yeah, eventually. Yeah, you gotta do a, a sick fucking full, full album playthrough headliner. Yeah, right. Be right. be killer. So you touched on it a little bit. I know this is probably a question that you get fucking every interview you do on every record cycle you've ever done. But I I did want to get into the three guitarists kind of thing, and you know we 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 talked about it a little bit earlier. But I know again from listening to you guys from the beginning and probably as a musician and a guitar player, why you guys are doing this. Like, I, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of why, even from the beginning, you guys decided to go that route. 
So if you want to give folks some insight on the reasoning behind why you guys, you know, have continued to do that and the benefits you find from it and all that good stuff. Well, you know, obviously as it first started out, it was more of a, I think, you know, for, for somatic, you know, I wasn't in the band at the time. I was around, but I wasn't, uh, that was Brandon Cagle, our sound guy, honestly, that's our, uh, our sound guy now, our sound engineer that comes on the road with us, but yeah, he was in the band for that album. And he was the other guitar player. And at the time when they got three guitar players, I think it was more like three people wanted the job and Acacia Stream had three guitar players. So it's like, oh, yeah, let's just fucking do it. <laughs> but then as time went on and I ended up being in the band after Somatic was released, uh, they started touring. I I, uh, I think it just worked out because we all had different writing styles. And as time went on, you know, I wrote a little more and a little more and a little more for every album. And then, uh, like, you know, I kind of earned my place, especially when it comes to, you know, doing, holding up my end of the, end of the, end of the, you know, hold, pulling my weight, man. That's what it comes yep. down to. Like, uh, who, I mean, if I'd have just been some fucking loser that just parties all the time <laughs> and didn't contribute anything to the band, I'm sure I wouldn't be in the band right now. But like, you know, I've, like, I, the, the whole audio aspect and like doing the live tracks and our live sessions and everything, like the kind of the more technical aspect, that's just kind of where I ended up falling into. Um, and to getting really good. Well, I, I don't say getting really good at it, but just getting, getting. You can give yourself getting, some credit, man. You're getting really getting, fucking good at it. <laughs> getting educated at it. Let's put it that way. Uh, and so having three guitar players, like everybody has their own, you know, like like Savage and Alex's songwriting is you can't you can't beat it, man. You know, and uh, I do best when I hear their stuff and I can put drums to it, and then I can give ideas, and then I have my own ideas sometimes that work out and pan out. But like, yeah. Honestly, man, like I love working with Alex and uh, Alex and Ben stuff for the most part. And you, w it wouldn't be the same if it wasn't all of us sitting here going, "Yes, do that. Yes, do this. Don't do this," et cetera, et cetera. Like sometimes, yes, there'll be a song that front to back is really good that somebody writes, and you don't really need much. Right. But other times, like songs are literally pieced together with all of our different riffs, or all of us sitting here going, "No, take that, put it there. Let me do these drums here. Change the tempo here." Like yeah it wouldn't be the same and uh and, it, and it, we're not biased about like you know who has the most material for a record it's just whoever has the most material that fits what we're wanting to do for the record right like um you know mark of the blade a lot of them <laughs> the one album of course but the a lot of the material <laughs> on mark of the blade was was like 70 percent of that was mine and yeah uh, it's the one album I don't like the most. Just and it's not because necessarily the material; it's just because how things went down with recording it and everything. And, right. Uh, but uh, it was just happened to be that, like you know, Alex and Ben, you, you go through phases. Like they were just they just didn't have they were just gassed out a little bit for the for the moment. And I had yeah. a lot of material, so it worked out. But then the Valley like rolls around. Uh, you know, I wrote Doom Woods and. I wrote parts and random songs, and then I wrote, I rearranged, and uh, re-recorded re uh, Brimstone because that that was just oh, too. Nice. That was just like riffs that uh, Savage had laying around, and I totally just rearranged. Like the main riff was like a tom fill or something, and I was like, Nah, this needs to be slammed out. And then <laughs> you know, here we go, here we are, and we, you know, Mark and I sat there and rearranged the song and recorded it, and I'm glad that we did. But uh, but then when it comes to like the rest of the album, a lot of the album was Ben and Alex and. For instance, uh, like j there's just there's just parts where if I'm sitting here programming drums and Alex is playing riffs and like tracking the demo stuff, I'll say, "Wait, you should do this there," and then he'll try it and it's like, "That's sick." Okay, perfect. And you know, so I don't think anybody individually writes the whole time. It's everybody collectively. So there's a reason all three of us are still here doing it. Yeah, and and that's the way to do it. And and I'm sure. You know, not not everybody knows who wrote what, but everybody can hear how you guys sound cohesively on each record or through all the through you know your whole discography. Well, yeah, we we can't. We, there's definitely songs where you're like, oh, that's Savage, oh, that's that's Alex, or oh, that's Zach. You know, uh, but we don't put in the you know how a lot of bands will put in the lyric book like who wrote the music for each song. Yeah, and uh, we don't do that. It's just not. It's just really silly, and the, the you know the publishing is not split up by who wrote the most. Of yep. One out, like it's all it's all split even, man. We all like because we all work our asses off, and it's only fair. Agreed. And, yeah, uh, we do the same thing, and and you know 
obviously not on the same level, but I was a firm kind of believer in that in the beginning that it's like, fuck this. We all worked on this shit. We all played some kind of part regardless of like, maybe there was one song that one of us didn't contribute anything musical to it, but there was still something going on during that time, during we were writing that record that they helped make that record, that song, what it is. Yes. And, and on, and on top of that, you can't, once the moment you start saying, okay, whoever writes the most material gets more money, you're putting a band to compete against each other. Yep. Like you can't do that, man. No. It's just it's super fucked up. And that's like bands like I'm sure there's bands where it's it's hard on people in bands when it's like, well, what's you know, I you know, obviously the people that have more clout in the band as far as there's always that guy, there's always the few guys that have the most clout and, you know, if it, if it comes down to money, well, what do you think is going to happen? Like you're going to get stepped on. Exactly, and, and then the moment you fight back, you have problems. So it's like it's just not even worth it. Yeah, a lot of politics that can that can come into to play with with all that shit, and I'm sure it it gets it can get even even more convoluted. The yes. the the bigger the bigger you know your band your band gets. So, do you have what would be some advice that you've got for for guys even like you know like me doing it or from the local bands doing it with with having you know getting ready for your eighth record what's what's some some things that that you've picked up along the way that you feel like other bands should should know um that's a tough question i think (laughs) i think with uh with being a musician, I think you need to realize that it's a gamble. <laughs> it is a gamble, unless you, you know, especially when you're first starting out, because you're going to start and you're going to be broke for a long time. Unless you have somebody that has money or your family has money and you don't have to worry about that, but, yeah, you know, it's a gamble. You're going to go on the road and you're going to possibly be broke for a long time. It's going to be hard to pay bills, but I mean, if you're doing it the right way and you're putting money back and you're trying to be business minded about it and not partying all the time, that's how you succeed. Yeah. And you know, nowadays it's even metal is so flooded, man. It's so hard to get out there and like really stand out. You know, uh, you have these bands that I feel like they're just paid for and put out there. They have a lot of like financial backing from like a label Yep. and you see their shit everywhere like that. What's that band? Star Set? Like, I saw ads for that band all the time. <laughs> I'd never heard them. And they just come out of nowhere. And I see ads for them. And they're huge. I'm not saying they're bad by any means. I just, I don't know. Right. I don't know the material. But, like, I'm like, well, where is this coming from? Yep. Because <laughs> I like to feel like I have a pretty good foot in the door when it comes to, like, what's good in metal and what's not. Right. And, uh, and so it was just kind of like, okay, you, somebody, somebody, either the label or somebody in the band has some money. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you know, there. But I mean, it works because then people, because people. Th- that's another thing too. Like you kind of have to invest in it because if you perceive yourself as being big, a lot of people buy that shit, man. It's 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 unfortunate, but it's true. Perception like, is uh, a big part of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you need to kind of you know, you need to kind of remember that. Like you got to show that you're kind of show that you're kind of big, but you got to be able to back it up too. So. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can only fake it till you make it so far with with this shit. Exactly. Word. So so what uh what gear are you using now, man? I know you in the last few years changed guitar companies, Aristides. I've been seeing the work that they've been putting out, and I saw some of the guitars that were getting built for you, and they look super sick. I don't know if you want to show off some of your gits. Uh yeah, I've been I've been playing. Uh, I did ESP for a long time. Uh, ended up parting ways with them. Um. Of course, there's still a, a ESP is still a great company, man. Like one of my favorite guitars ever is that blue custom back there. There's my Eclipse, but uh, uh, the RCDs, man, it's it's weird. It's like it's not they're not for everybody, but like like this is one of the first ones I got from them. Um, this is just a uh, we call it the color Lambo Gray. Uh, Sick. It's one of the first. It's my G guitar. It's it's set up for G and like it's literally really odd man because when we were doing actually when we were doing Mark of the Blade Mark got one of these sent to the studio and I'd been seeing them here and there and I'm like there's no way this sounds good 
<laughs> so I, we take it out of the box and I start playing around on it. I'm like, holy crap, this acoustically by itself sounds great. The fretting feels awesome. The fret work is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, this feels really, really good. I was like, what the what the hell? Let's plug it up. Let's see what it sounds like. We plugged it up. And at the time, it had a, uh, what is that, Seymour Duncan, the Sentient, I think, um, or the Nazgul, I can't remember which is in the bridge position, but uh, it had a Duncan in it. And we plug it up, and even with a Duncan in it, I'm just, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just not a Duncan fan. But, uh, yeah. We plug it up, and couldn't believe how it sounded, man. Like it sounded like the 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 notes sound like a piano. Like the the top the low strings were cutting. It sounded really even. It was super even. And I got to doing some research. You know, the material is made out of a man-made product called Arium, and it's supposed to mimic the porousness of wood, but with no imperfections. You know, you can have a guitar cut from the same tree made the exact same way but it's going to sound totally different yep this guitar if you wanted this exact guitar within a percentage outside of like how you route everything and your pickups you will have the exact same guitar as this one like there's no you don't get anything different it is this guitar and the only thing is you know this is kind of one sound it's uh when I say one sound, I mean the resonate, the, how the body resonates. It's, it's just, every guitar is the same material, right? So, but it's almost like the purest form of your pickup. And this was this was used all over the valley. Like, uh, you know, uh, we use different guitars in the album, and this was used for a lot of like the lower G stuff, like Black Bear and Brimstone and stuff like that, because the pop string just sings, you know. It's yeah. Just, and it's uh, it's got huge low end, and uh, I don't know, man. I I. I picked it up and started playing it and couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way this piece of plastic sounds good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, it's hard to believe, but here we are. And it's, uh, it's, I mean, shit, man, I've been with them. I've been with them ever since. Uh, I, you know, there's, there's, as far as like the guitars holding up on the road, man, like this is the same setup since I've got it. And that was like three years ago. And I've taken this on every tour since I've had it. Holy and shit. I beat the crap out of this thing. And it's all, it got all kinds of chips in it, you know, just from being beat up at like, Dude, it's still. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying like, I you know some of my LTDs back in the day couldn't do that. Um, the LT in the LTDs, they're not bad. They just it's just it's, you just get what you pay for. You know, yep. especially from ESP. Like, if you have a three thousand dollar custom from ESP, that thing probably is awesome. Yeah. You know? But uh, yeah. Uh, it's definitely no. It's definitely uh, it's definitely the like changed my mind when it came to the company and. Been with them ever since I'll show uh, I'll show the multi scale one here. Nice. So they do a multi scale version, and it is. This is my valley theme when I got it themed like after the valley as far as the color scheme goes, and you can Fucking see the sick. Wow. You can see the, the neck piece there it has a has the star on. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but uh, they did a really good job. And this is a multi scale in. Yeah, the top strings, you know, the, the other guitar is 26.5 all the way across, and the top string on this one's 27. And then uh, it really, really helps out a lot with those lower strings as far as keeping the tension on it. Yep. And it was a little weird getting used to the multi scale at first, but uh, these are Lundgren's, uh, the the Black Heavens, because, um, you know, DiMarzio doesn't make a multi scale pickup yet. Um, <laughs> but the well, Lundgren's the next best thing, man. Like, the, those, their pickups are so super sick they're phenomenal uh but demarzio you know that's my that's my company but like uh lundgren's phenomenal man that this guitar is fucking awesome and i had him i got i didn't want to take it on the road because I, I put little chips on it and i was like man i really don't want to mess up this guitar <laughs> and i was at the factory and was talking to the owner pascal about it and he said well why don't we just give you a raw and they have a, a, a one called a, a, a raw that they make, which is literally just the same. It's the same guitar, but the mold itself that they make the material out of yep. is colored with pigment. So there's no paint job. It's just wow. it's just the mold itself, and they put like a satin clear coat on. That's it. So it's even a little more resonant because there's not much paint on it. But you don't have to worry about you know the dings and everything on this one. It's literally a, a still an RSTs, but it's just. You know the paint job's not super crazy, but look how clean it looks. Though you can't, you can't go wrong with black and gold, man. <laughs> no, that's insane. That thing looks fucking classy, man. This guitar is sick, man. It is, it is phenomenal. And I haven't got to take it on tour yet, but uh, it's a, uh, it's a monster, dude. I've been doing some stuff with it. I'm actually doing a Doom Woods playthrough right now, and I'm using this one to track it. So. Nice, fuck yeah. 
Well, let's. Uh, I think that would be a good time if you wanted to to jam on some riffage. If you wanted to. Well, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> it comes down to like what uh, if anybody wants to hear anything. I'm not. I'm not sure if. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody yeah, like you guys want to hear shit or not. But like I, I've got like, I've got this one right here plugged up with the Kemper tone, but uh, I'm trying to make another Kemper pack right now, and uh, I've been messing around with some different mic setups and everything. And I, you know, this this is not probably not going to make it on the pack, but it's a it's okay tone. It's a it's a it's the uh, the Driftwood amp with a grind boost pedal, and it's uh an Erland microphone with a 421 Sennheiser and uh, it's blended and it's uh it's on a it's on a Mesa cab but uh nice <laughs> the more I do Kemper like Kemper is super sick for live and I love it in the studio especially for like you know we did two albums with Kemper um we did uh uh self-titled in, in Endless War with uh, Kemper and uh oh shit it you know it turned out great uh but the more i'm like getting in a micing you know been the past few years just like really sitting down and micing guitar cabs like uh <laughs> it's hard for me to want to use the kemper anymore man now that i got a setup like and cabs mic'd up downstairs all the time it's like it's hard not to just want to use real amps all the time because the Kemper's for awesome man, it's phenomenal, but you can't beat a real amp. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you got them, absolutely. But I'm sure you, having that that practicality of the Kemper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Kemper, you, dude. In Europe, like taking it on tour, you can't. I mean, we just rent them. We rent Kempers over there, and we put our all of our stuff on a thumb drive, and you know, you plug it up, and you have your exact same setup. So that's it's phenomenal. So sick. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and shred your face off, but, like, I don't know if you might <laughs> want to hear stuff or not. But, like, uh, I'm, I don't know. This, this, uh, this guitar actually had a, a coil split put in it. So, like, you pull, you have to push pull on the volume knob here. Nice. It'll split, it'll split the pickup, whichever pickup you're on. <laughs> Is it that single coil? It's not like a true single coil sound. It'll never be like that. Cause like, yeah, it's kind of a cheap trick. But uh, <laughs> it sounds cool though, especially in I know like live a lot. I'll do uh, like if we're playing uh, possibilities, like the verse riff. You know, it's like, <laughs> but then I'll pull it out for that part. It gives it a little. <laughs> Just different, you know. Oh, mean, dude. Yeah, I love, I love the cool stuff here. You can see that. It's like, it's like playing a telly but in drop G. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. That's. Uh, I don't know how you all like to play your action either. Like, I like mine pretty high, uh, especially yeah. in a lot of shooting stuff. Um, but the good part about these guitars as well, you know, if you if you adjust the truss rod on guitar, you gotta wait like maybe I don't know, like maybe a day for it to settle to really see how the adjustment went yep the good part about these it's instantaneous you don't have to wait wow. you can literally like adjust your neck and be like i don't like that and pull it right back and it's fine <laughs> that's insane it, right. and it's just the material the way it responds to that stuff well it's the it's just a little more flexible than wood yeah uh if i had anything to recommend to them i would be like you know the neck could do with being a little stiffer and i only say that because like you know, I'll be moving around sometimes live. You can see how, like, dense out of pitch. Yeah. Like, I mean, any guitar will if you push on the neck, but like, it's just a little. Like, I just gotta be, I gotta be weary of it and just nope. think about what I'm playing. And uh, that's really, that's really it. But past that, man, like, uh, it's just the way the, it's just the flexibility of the material. You know, versus wood, which wood gets, wood only depending on the type of wood, too, man, like. Wood only bends and moves so much, and if you bend it too much and too fast, it breaks. You know, yeah. so um, like, and that's why you got to go so slow with the truss rod because depending on what your neck's made out of, you know, if you have a if you have a maple neck, dude, that's 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 hard wood. <laughs> you know, it doesn't want to move very well. So, yep. Um, but this is, I mean, this, this is the future, man. Like, uh, these, I'm not saying wood will ever be replaced because it won't, but uh. <laughs> These guitars, are another, I mean, 
a lot of people hate the indentions on them, and they, I can take them or leave them, but I, it doesn't make me not like them. Like, that's like, if that's, if the whole guitar is 100%, this is like, you know, 0.1% of the guitar that I don't like if I didn't like it. But I don't dislike it either. That's their, that's their signature look, so. Yeah, yeah, I've never, I've never had the opportunity to play one, so next time you guys come through, I gotta check that thing out. Uh, it'll change your life, man, you won't want one <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it, because, I mean, you know, I've been playing those LTDs for so long, and, uh, and I didn't, I didn't dislike my LTDs, man. It's just, they just weren't this guitar. They just weren't the RSTs. And uh, for lower tune stuff, like their eight, like when I was at their factory, I got to play on one of the multi-scale eight strings. Man, like you can't beat that thing. It's like, <laughs> like it was, it was the scale, the, the scale length was phenomenal, and the cut of that top string, man, like it was, like you couldn't, it just worked so well with the body style, the body material. And uh, I would love to have an A string from them. The only problem is we don't really, you know, I want to take guitar string and I use. I just I would have an A string just to mess around on, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Because we don't really we don't really like write a lot of stuff. On this thing. Maybe it'll make its way onto some new Whitechapel. Who knows? Well, that means we have to all get eight strings and take more guitars on the road. Oh, so. that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, yeah fuck that. Fuck that. I know. I know that struggle. Have, <laughs> we only we already have two different tunings, and that's enough. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah word uh, so so coming up did you did you have like a pretty supportive family with with all the music stuff yeah well you know my mom always pushed us to play music like all of myself and my brothers um awesome i i played violin starting in second grade and played it all the way through high school no shit yeah that's where i started that's where i got my background in music you could say but then i picked up the guitar in fifth grade and just sounded everything out you know that's how i started playing guitar yeah but because I already had the ear for it, and I, I took a year of piano lessons. I wasn't really into it as a kid, but uh, you know, I kind of wish I'd have stuck with it because it's a good, you know, it's a good, good exercise, especially like just you know, your finger, your finger coordination and everything. Like, oh yeah, great. Uh, but past that, man, I you know I stopped playing violin then. But then, uh, my parents, you know. They they were always they never said I couldn't play in the bands I was in and like the the they never said no ever you know they 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 listened to me practice guitar in my room and play the same riff over and over and over again you know? <laughs> all of my parents crazy. have yeah but but when I told them like I was almost done with music man uh until I got asked to fill in at the time I was going to fill in for Brandon because he'd hurt his arm you know and uh, yeah and. I didn't know it was gonna be permanent, but I was, you know, I was almost done with music. But I was like, whatever, I'll give it one last try. I might as well do this. And I had just lost my job because uh, they were, you know, they were cutting back on, you know, employees because they, you know, it was a paint company and they couldn't afford to keep me on. Yeah. So I just lost it. I was looking for another job. I was like, whatever. If, if I'm gonna do it now, it's the time. And well, here we are. <laughs> so. Man, talk about, talk about fucking. I don't know, like luck oppor- meets opportunity meets like that's if I had a job if I had that's a job, crazy I would have said no like i mean it's weird <laughs> to think about. yeah so i guess it was kind of meant to happen or if you believe in kind of stuff or whatever but uh yeah yeah man it um but when i said when i told him that i was like look this is band i want to go on tour with them and my mom was like oh god <laughs> you know? so but they didn't say no i mean i was old enough to like do it myself if i wanted to but uh yeah. they didn't say no they said I was dumb, probably, but you know. <laughs> but uh, you, you know, but any parent would be skeptical because they don't know what's gonna happen. You know, of course, a bunch of young kids driving around in a van. You know, it's it's got to make your parents worry a little bit. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Even to this day, I'm sure your mom's still checking up on you on the road. Oh, like. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but uh, they never said no. They never uh, they never like they never put down music they always encouraged music and if i ever had kids i will do the same thing yeah i'll encourage and my parents were very they might be a little conservative i guess because they're from tennessee you know they're it's just how they're raised they're older yeah um and you know they took us they took myself my brother they took me and my brothers to church until i was in like fifth grade and then they finally said you know now you know what it's about so you can kind of decide for yourself and that's huge man that's what I'm saying. I think, and I, I will raise my kids the exact same way. And I will, you know, I'll be like, here's the world, you know, this is what it is, you know, take it as it is, but I will encourage like anything you want to do as long as it's not, you know, idolizing Trump. But, 
That's right. <laughs> hurting yourself, hurting yourself, hurting somebody else, going yeah, right, going right. going a little too far in, in either direction. But but that's you don't you don't hear a lot of stories like that, especially you know coming from, from folks that yeah from the south from folks that are more conservative. Having that be part of how you were brought up, I'm sure, eventually is what kind of led you to metal, right? Because like I can, I, I have the the confidence to to search things for myself, and I'm not having to worry about my parents like flipping out if I'm, you know, check checking something new out or or branching off into something that's a little bit different than they're probably expecting. I'm sure they were worried about some of the music, but like. Yeah. You know, they, they made sure to understand that, like, I, I, like, they made sure I knew it was art and it was a theme and not to be taken literal. Like, right, right. Know. I'm sure they're not reading the lyrics to Somatic and, uh... <laughs> yeah, and, and, like, you know, it's, it is definitely kind of hard to, like, you know, people that don't know any better, like, oh, you've been in a band for 15 years, you're successful, like, I'll have to look them up sometime, the first thing that comes up is probably, like, you know... Vicer, Vicer yeah. or something like that. Or, and I'm like, oh god. I usually just tell them, yeah, yeah, you should go check out this song, and right. then you know, give them give them one of the one of the less uh, one of the less crass ones. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but past that, you know, my parents were just. They, I was lucky with that, man. They they were kind of conservative, but they were just 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 con- not conservative enough to like let me do my thing. So killer worked out so last couple of things i wanted to chat about so we talked about it a little bit before the stream started up as well but and you kind of gave me a little bit of insight but was there a point or has there been a point in your career that has really where you feel like the band took that step that it's that it's like okay this is we were touring before we were doing it at a certain we were playing certain slots now it's it's different now it's we're we're at a, a different level you know uh i thought about it a little more and like you know when we did i don't know if you remember we did that tour like that welcome to hell tour yeah yeah i look back now and i'm like it would almost be like impossible i feel like to do another tour that pulled those numbers because the lineup was sick and you know at the time we were just kind of the hot commodity and yeah. like <laughs> But we didn't have the know-how to put on a show for a tour like that. Right. So at the time, we're like, oh, this is super sick. And then as you get in better slots, playing bigger headlining shows, it's like we realized a little too late, like, this is how we should have been doing it. Yep. And there's never a point where, I, like I said, there's never a point I was like, yes, we've made it. There's a, For me now, you know, I could be... Like, we played this show in Manila, dude. It was absolutely insane. Like, I've never seen so many people going crazy... Like, I've never seen so many long-haired people headbanging to the end of This Is Exile. Like Fuck it was, yeah, dude. It was, like, insane to watch. And But even as exciting as that was, I'm like, we still need to do better. Like, yeah. I didn't say to myself, man, we've made it, bro. That's just, <laughs> just a stupid attitude, man. Like, yeah. you should be proud of yourself, but, like, you know, we, I'm still sitting there thinking, imagine playing this kind of show and having production and having the right production and putting on a show – have you been to see Ghost any time recently? That I haven't. Is, is it? That is a show. That is literally a Broadway show with musicians, <laughs> but it's but it's rock and roll and metal, and it's phenomenal. That uh, is how I you need to check the them show. out. Uh, the, them and like, and then you have Mashuga, like the other end of the spectrum. Like they're oh. not doing anything super crazy, but their light show is incredible. And not to, I mean, let's be honest, their musicianship is you can, unparalleled. You can't touch them. But, not uh, at all. But like watching them is literally spiritual. It's a spiritual experience, yep. and it's, you will like you will when they're done playing. You're like, oh, I want more. Why would they stop? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is rare because people have pretty short attention spans these days. <laughs> yeah, for me, man, like Mashuga is one of those bands I could just watch and play for hours. And and from the first note when it comes in, man, I'm like, holy fuck! I didn't know it could I didn't know music could be this heavy. But then it's weird because I don't watch a lot of live bands as much anymore. So when I finally get out front and feel, you know. I'm like, man, I wonder if we sound heavy. You know, it's like, it's like I wonder if I had to, because I never see our band from the outside. You know what right. I'm saying? It's so weird. Well, but, I will say you guys sound fucking crushing. All the times that I've seen you, you you sound heavy. <laughs> our sound guy Brandon is a wizard. He's an absolute wizard, man. He's a uh, he's something else. And yeah. He, uh, 
he definitely has changed and grow grew with us over time to mold and be a better sound engineer for it's like it was like a you know it's kind of like a scratch your back out scratch your ears like he kind of can learn doing us and uh he already had a he's already smart anyway he's like probably one of the smartest people i know but like he already had a good grasp on it but it's like you know you still gonna make mistakes along the way right but he can do it with us while we had the benefit of someone knowing our music like he does and making us sound killer so uh it works out you know he's he's like it's like i never want other sound guy that's that's fucking awesome and it's rare too especially how, how long he's been with you guys typically yeah. you know you rotate through sound guys or they in a lot of instances in our instance for example they outgrow you and they end up doing something else like i don't know if you know alex kendrick who i think he did a tour with you guys with like rings of saturn maybe or yeah, something he, he, let, he left a message on here actually on the on he the, did yeah yeah he yeah, did yeah, he's that. he's the homie he was our first sound guy we took him out on his first tour now he's doing all kinds of sick shit so shout yeah, out to him yeah no, he is yeah absolutely and uh no and it's cool that they get to grow they got to start somewhere but luckily brandon he started you know with like three eyes of dead and kitty he did kitty for a long time no shit <laughs> yeah he was on he was on the road with kitty for a long time Whoa. Uh, and he worked at a venue in virginia for a long time and like we played that been, venue he did sound at that venue that we, and we we played there what, what yeah, the fuck yeah. is the venue called I, I can't remember the the name of it but oh like, but that's where i met him yeah and he so he had good footing for it but like you know as he got better equipment better know-how like his setup now is unreal and uh it only benefits us to support him kind of doing that you know because it's gonna yeah. make us sound better exactly and especially with like doing the singing and stuff like that and everything now like it really takes an art to do that shit live and do it uh correctly because like you know it, he's not just setting up a mic and going like all right this is the same setting for screaming and singing so uh right. good luck you know it's like you it's really an art and especially with the effects and i mean just dialing it like dialing it in in a studio where it's the same room every day is different where imagine being in a different room every day with a different pa you know oh so, yeah like, it's it's big shout out to front of house guys because those are some unsung heroes in doing what we do man <laughs> metallica sound guy holy shit like he's yeah. he's like mastered mixing in the round you know what i'm saying like yeah like, their their stage is a fucking circle I mean, what who can say fuck? that? Who can who can say like, yeah, I'm good at that. I started doing that. What's up? You know, that's insane. I know, yeah. I didn't even think about that actually. And yeah. goes to show like, even people in the industry don't even completely fathom front of house guys, and that that's nuts. You're not your LD and your front of house guy and your your stage hands like they're the ones that make the show happen. I mean, yep. this is just a bunch of fucking pansies. <laughs> you heard that? Zach's calling you a pansy. Yeah, no. you're, you're all pansies. <laughs> Um, so do you have some favorite cities or countries that, that you look forward to hitting on, on every tour? I'm, I'm sure they can kind of all blend in together a little bit, but are there a few that you're like every tour you're like, Hey, booking agent, let's make sure we fucking hit this place or, uh, well, we don't really get to tell our booking agent where we go. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of the time it's just whatever's available and will give us the right guarantee because yep. you know, at, at a point it's like well we have a business to run and this is the overhead so yeah yeah absolutely uh, but um, I mean you know there's a the typical stuff like Denver's always I, I say Denver because the shows are always sick yeah uh, you know everybody says Denver you know oh weed yeah but like <laughs> that aside the shows are always insanely sick um uh, and I know it's typical to say it too, but San Diego. I don't something about San Diego. I always love because the weather's obviously perfect, but like it's a cool oh. vibe. I love San Diego. Um, but as far as like, my, I'm more overseas, man. Like, there's a lot of parts of Europe I really, really like. Uh, yep. I've come to like fall in love with a lot of parts of Europe and uh, the Netherlands. Dude, I could. I if I ever moved anywhere, it'd probably be the Netherlands. Um, I love the Netherlands, man. Same here, man. They though there and like. I love Belgium. Um, I love like you know. There's a lot of there's a lot of fucked up shit in Eastern Europe as far as like there's still a lot of racism and stuff like that. But yeah. there's parts of Slovenia and Slovakia that are like places you have never seen before as far as like how gorgeous they are. Yeah. Like you don't have. I mean, there's places like that in the U.S., but you know, 
it's something else over there, man. There's a place we drove through called Lake Bled. It's like pronounced like B L E D. I'm not sure how it's spelled though. Uh, and it was literally the most, one of the most on spot. That in the Alps, like driving through the Alps. If you're ever in the uh, in the winter time, like if uh, if you're ever awake early early enough to see the bus driving through the Alps in the winter time, like yep. you've never seen shit like that. And that's the parts of touring where it's like, man. I really wish I could experience this more, but I got to go to a venue that yeah. smells like a toilet <laughs> and sit there for a few hours and here we are. So, and then leave. Yeah. Yeah. It's hopefully we get to the venue with enough time to do a little bit of exploring. That's, that's what we, we really made it a point when we went out there. Um, we've only been able to go out there once, but made it a point every day to go do some exploring, do some hiking, just kind of try and immerse ourselves as much as we could in the different cultures and, and see how, how things work and, and really take it in because I don't know about you being from, you know, Knoxville, me being from Miami, from South Florida, I never would have been able to do this otherwise. I never would have been able to see countries like that otherwise or meet people. And, and really, I think Miami is a little bit of a kind of a, a a mixed pot with culture, but I don't think I, to the degree that I've been able to experience and been fortunate enough to do that. I don't think I ever would have been able to do that. Right. Well, you got a message on here. said, someone said you should try and hit up Heapy to do something like this. He's been streaming a lot lately. There you go. There's your next. Look at you keeping up with the comments, making me well, look I bad. Have a phone right here. <laughs> I, I, uh, I wish I could do something with Matt Heafy. I don't think, uh, I think I'm a little small time for Matt Heafy, but I would definitely be down. I would be so down. Yeah, he, uh, he'd give you a vocal lesson or something, man. He's, uh, he's all about doing the vocals on the Twitch. Yeah, he's killing his, his streaming lately. That's, that's it's unreal, dude. <laughs> 100% an idol of mine in regards to streaming. Obviously his band, I, I watched him on there just playing through full albums you, you got to have some balls to do that dude that's it's yeah no i'll give him that much i mean it's it's a it's crazy to put yourself out there and worry about sucking i don't even like playing like doing this right now but right. That's not, it's, not, it's not your all's fault it's just like it's like i'd rather be playing with my band in front of ten thousand people than doing you know than playing in front of like however many you know a few viewers like watching me play guitar because like it's just a, it's just something i hadn't done a lot and it was like I did a wedding one time, and my friend was like, "You gotta play the wedding march, but do it like rock and roll style." And I was, you know, I said no because that's dumb. But yeah. he was like, "No, that's my wedding gift to me," and I'm like, "Fuck!" So I had to do it. So, oh, nice! Is there video of that? <laughs> I don't. I'm sure he still has a video, but uh, I did fine. Uh, I took a shot before I went up there and did it. Okay. But uh, you know, it's it's someone's wedding, so that was the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. When I went yeah. To because you have to stand in the crowd afterward and talk to everybody. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I no just, green room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No green room. So luckily you did all right. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I, I think I nailed it for the most part. But it was just like, I practiced it a lot. But it was just you know you can practice it a thousand times and get on stage and just fuck it up. So. Yep, yep. I I know the feeling. <laughs> Well, Zach, dude, thank you fucking so much for being on. Like I said, I've been listening to you guys for, I'm 30 now, fucking 12 years. And you guys have always been a huge inspiration for us, really a band to aspire to. And getting to watch you guys, getting to watch you guys grow and to watch the sound change has has really been awesome. And, and like I said, it's something that I I personally keep in mind when I'm doing what i do with with my band it's you know your name comes up and your guy's name comes up very often in who are bands that we would love to tour with who are bands that have a kind of career that we would like to emulate so we we think a lot about that shit obviously and i'm sure you guys do too but just wanted to again thank you thank you for giving the folks watching and the folks that'll be listening later on spotify and all that shit some some insight into the Whitechapel world any any parting words for for the folks listening or, or watching well you you made a comment that kind of you know it's kind of a good lesson like you know if you're if you're trying to be a band and stuff like that just look at the bands that are big that you that you uh take influence from that are big and successful and don't copy what they're doing but watch how they do things live and how they run their business watch how they do you know how they handle themselves how they or how they're tactful about it um especially live shows man like watch how a band puts on a show so you 
you know, you got to get there and like put on a show within your means. Obviously, I don't expect you to watch Slip Out and go, well, we need a you know thirty thousand dollars in production. No, I'm saying just watch <laughs> how some bands watch how some bands like just just the flow of a show. You know, making it something that wants to reel people in. Like so, watch your idols. Pay attention to them, not just the music and them playing live, but pay attention to how their show is, and pay attention to how they're doing things because that's how you you know. These these methods, the way things have, are done, have been developed over years and years of bands touring, and not only will you develop some of your own as you do it, but like it's not bad to take a little influence and take some tricks here and there to make your show even better and make your band uh, perform better or be better business minded. Like yeah, yeah, you need to you need to pay attention to them and uh, just just be original. Don't rip them off. That's the most important part. <laughs> doing our best man so <laughs> if you hear some some white chapel influence on our stuff sorry <laughs> no no no, no. Take, take influence take influence nah, that's not, that's not like just 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 don't you know it's like you know okay okay now i have a riff that's my riff one note different so i didn't rip them off it's extremely original you should yeah, exactly. put that in a song <laughs> But yeah, man, no problem. Thank you for everybody for listening. I appreciate it. Man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again. And dude, we will we will catch up soon. And hopefully after all the shit's over, we can catch up at a show again. And I know you're usually running around uh, days of, of gigs, but hopefully we can we can do some catching up and I can peep that our cities. Absolutely, man. Thank you all for listening. Everyone stay safe. All right. Take care, dude. See you guys. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for everybody that stuck around for the live stream today. I know we went a little over two hours here, it looks like. So if you've been watching since the beginning, thank you. If you popped in and out, I appreciate it as well. If you stuck around through the middle and said, fuck this, I'm going to catch it on Spotify later, definitely check it out on Spotify. This episode should be up hopefully in the next couple of weeks as I get some more out. So Definitely keep an eye out on the Spotify for all of these live streamed episodes. If you want to go back to it, if you want to listen to it, I hope you had some great takeaways from our interview with Terrence and our interview with Zach as well. We're going to keep doing these. So we'll be going live again this coming Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We've got a couple of great guests coming up for next Wednesday going to be sharing some flyers around for for that and posting all over the social medias like we do so thank you again for for hanging out everybody stay safe stay inside wash your hands and have a good night <laughs>